Majesty, will now come to order, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to this hearing before the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security on Making Communities Safer, Youth Violence, and Gang Interventions That Work. Uh, recent news reports cite increases in crime in several major cities, particularly violent crimes. Much of the crime, <clears throat> much of the rise in violent crimes reported is attributable to youth, including youth associated with gangs. Even before the recent reports suggesting increases in violence committed by youth, we've seen reports of increasing gang violence and other criminal activities on a local as well as international scale. A few years ago, the Washington, D.C. area saw reports of gang violence attributed to gangs such as MS-13. There are also reports of gang rivalries revol resulting in murders in several youths in the district and the Maryland suburbs. Congress sought to respond to these reports, as we usually do, with legislation calling for more death penalties, more mandatory minimum sentences, and treating more juveniles as adults. We faced a similar situation in the mid-1990s with legislation such as the Violent Youth Predator Act. You can tell from the title what the bill called for, and it did, treating more juveniles as adults, mandatory minimums, death penalties, and so forth. We debated this type of legislation over several Congresses until... Then Subcommittee Chairman Bill McCollum of Florida and I put together a hearing similar to this one and decided to propose bipartisan legislation based on recommendations from the researchers, practitioners, and other experts we called as witnesses. That legislation was the consequences for Juvenile Offenders Act. It called for a system of early interventions with graduated sanctions or services, as the individual case required, to divert juveniles from further crime and violence. The legislation was supported by all members of the subcommittee and most of the members of the full committee, including the chairman and ranking member. It was also supported by a broad spectrum of those working with juveniles, including advocates, researchers, juvenile judges, juvenile administrators, law enforcement, local and state, and others. In addition, in the wake of the Columbine school shootings, then Speaker Hastert and then Minority Leader Gephardt appointed a bipartisan task force of members who did the same thing as Bill McCollum and I did, called, for, called, in some, called in some law enforcement officials and other experts and issued a report reflecting their recommendations, which were similar to those received at the crime subcommittee hearing. The legislation based on, recommend, the le registration, the legislation based on recommendation, recommendations of the experts passed the House with, near, with a near unanimous vote and was eventually passed into law. Of course, the legislation took nothing away from the already existing tough laws and law enforcement approaches available to deal with juveniles and others committing crimes. Juveniles were already being routinely transferred to adult court for the very serious offenses, and nothing in the legislation stopped that. The U.S. already locks out more people per capita than any, any other country on earth by far. The average lockup rate around the country is about 100 per 100,000. For example, Australia's rate is 126 per 100,000, Canada's 107, England 148, France 85, China 118, Japan 62, India 30 per 100,000. The U.S. rate, uh, the second highest rate is 611 in Russia. The United States rate is 733 and rates of 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000 in inner cities is not un unheard of, 100 per 100,000 international average. Rather than simply adding to the world's worst incarceration rate, the legislation that we hope to en enact will be aimed at cutting off the pipeline for the next group of offenders. It, it will be designed to add something else to the balance with research and experts uh, say is needed, and that is crime prevention. Unfortunately, the funding that we authorized to implement the legislation was never provided. We ended up with 20% of the authorized uh, level, and the level has gone down ever since. So we're once again considering what to do about the reports of juvenile uh, crime without having done what we were told to do to begin with. A lot has happened in the interim. We've learned more about effective approaches to addressing uh, youth violence and youth crime. And we have an impressive panel of experts here today to tell us about that research, the evidence, and the experience uh, to show what advice, and, and hopefully they'll give advice to Congress on how we can do the right thing. 
I look forward to their testimony and working with Ranking Member Forbes in incorporating the testimony into legislative efforts at addressing youth and gang violence. It's now my privilege to recognize our Ranking Member, the gentleman from Virginia, Congressman Randy Forbes, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me also thank all the witnesses for being here today. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this uh, hearing today. Um, one of the things that uh, I think has become clear to us, although it wasn't clear to all the members of the Judiciary Committee last year when we tried to begin to put forward uh, legislation dealing with gangs, is that we do have a gang problem in the United States. And we had several of our members uh, who asked the, the question last year when we had this, do we have a problem? Where's the problem? I don't see the problem. Well, I, don't, I think everybody across the country now understands the significance of the gang problem. As you and I are sitting here today, we have approximately 850,000 uh, criminal gang members in the United States. And if you put a uh, touchstone that gives us a little better measuring device on that, we would have approximately the sixth largest army in the world that is within our borders right now. And the whole scope of gangs has changed enormously. Uh, although many of you have dealt with this problem longer than I have, I've dealt with it now about 16 years. And I remember when we started dealing with it back in the late 80s and the early 90s, as we would go to groups and talk to them about what causes you to get into gangs, it would be the same things that we would hear over and over again, sense of belonging, wanting to have a family connection. The gangs were like our families. Um, as we have looked since... Um, the uh, year 2000, that has metamorphosized quite a bit and it has changed dramatically now. And, and more and more now we are hearing people tell us we need to be in gangs for protection because we are afraid that if we're not in a gang, uh, there's no way that we can be safe uh, out on the streets. Um, one of the things that um, we all feel that we see in our offices is um, I have my door opened all the time to people coming in to chat with me who want funding and in almost every situation I can tell you it doesn't matter whether they're renovating an old school or whether they have a martial arts program one of the things that they always tell us as soon as they're in there and they've told us their funding needs the next two things is they tell us this has something to do with homeland security or juvenile crime prevention. And uh, we're looking in there and shaking our head and saying, how does renovating this old school do anything to protect us from terrorism? How does your program over here do anything to help us uh, deal with uh, juvenile crime prevention? Uh, just two last points, and, and I'll, I'll put my full remarks in the record, but uh, the chairman mentioned the fact that we needed to cut off the pipeline. And the greatest pipeline that we have out there today are these gang networks. And sometimes we think that uh, the gang leadership are 15, 16 year olds running around. Many of the gang leaders that we see in our country today are actually moving on up in age. Some of them are in their 30s, some 40s. In fact, it's so funny because we see some of the old gang leadership now going around in wheelchairs, and you know we jokingly say they're going to be coming here asking us for retirement benefits uh, later on down the road. But we have, if you're looking at the pipeline and you're looking at how do we really cut that pipeline out, what can we do for gang prevention, one of the things we have to keep on the table is reaching up and pulling those gang networks down and the leadership down that's continuing to try to franchise their efforts and, and what they're doing because the gangs we have today that really frighten us the most are no longer just local gangs. They're international gangs and national gangs and they have networks of communication and travel like we have uh, seldom seen before. And the last thing, Mr. Chairman, um, we have an unusual panel, not just in your, your talent and your ability, but it is almost impossible when you have logistically staged the way we have and you have eight members sitting out there to testify um, that we'll be able to ask you all the questions we want to ask you, but we're going to try, and if we can't get them in today, we'll try to supplement that with maybe some written questions to you down the road. So thank you for being here. We look forward um, to uh, being able to ask you some questions and hear your testimony as we move forward with the hearing. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> We're joined by the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, and the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Chabot. And without objection, all members may include opening statements in the record at this point. Um, 
in response to the uh, ability to question witnesses, we would expect more than one round if necessary so that we can get in as many questions as we can. We have a distinguished panel of witnesses here uh, with us today to help us consider the important issues that are before us. Our first witness will be Professor Dell Elliott, who is the director of the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence at the University of Colorado, where he's also a distinguished professor emeritus for the Department of Sociology. Uh, prior to holding his current office, he served as the director for the University of Colorado's program on problem behavior, as well as for the Behavioral Research Institute in Boulder. In recognition for his efforts, he has received numerous national awards, including the Public Health Service Medallion for Distinguished Service from the U.S. Surgeon General and an Outstanding Achievement Award from the U.S. Department of Justice. He received his bachelor's degree from Phenoma uh, College and his master's degree and Ph.D. from the University of Washington in Seattle. Our next witness, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Butts, is a research fellow with the Chapin Hall Center for Children at the University of Chicago, where he also teaches in the School of Social Service Administration. He began his juvenile justice career as a, as a drug and alcohol counselor with the Juvenile Court in Eugene, Oregon, and has since served as a senior researcher at the National Center for Juvenile Justice and is the former director of the Program for Youth Justice at the Urban Institute. Dr. Butts has a, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon, a master's degree in social work from Portland State University, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, next is Professor Lawrence Sherman, director of the Jerry Lee Center in Criminology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's also a professor in the departments of sociology and criminology. Prior to his current pro post, he was the Chair of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Maryland at College Park, and also taught at Yale, the State University of New York at Albany, Rutgers University, and the Australian National University. He holds a bachelor's degree from Denison University, master's degrees from the University of Chicago and Yale University, as well as a diploma in criminology from Cambridge University. Next, we'll hear from David Kennedy, Mr. David Kennedy, uh, director of the Center for Crime Prevention and Control at the J John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, where he is also a professor in anthropology. Prior to his position at John Jay College, Mr. Kennedy was a senior researcher and adjunct professor at the, uh, at the program in criminal justice policy and management, excuse me, policy and management for the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He received his bachelor's degree with higher honors in philosophy and history from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> uh, then we'll hear from uh, Chief James Corwin, Chief of Police at Kansas City, Missouri uh, Police Department. He served with Kansas City, Missouri Police Department since his appointment as a police officer in 1979. He also served on numerous boards in, com in the community, including the Missouri Emergency Response Committee and the Kansas City, Missouri Crime Commission. He holds a bachelor's degree uh, from Central Missouri State and a, ma and a master's degree from Webster University. He's also a graduate of Kansas City, Missouri Regional Police Academy, the Missouri State Highway Patrol Academy, and the 192nd session of the FBI National Academy. We'll hear from Mia, is it Mia? Mia Fernandez is a legal and strategy uh, director for the Latin America Youth Center in Washington, D.C., where she's also served as a special assistant um, to the Assistant Attorney General in the Office of, J of Justice Programs. Prior to her current post, Ms. Fernandez also served as an uh, Assistant District Attorney in Manhattan and also as an, uh, an aide to Congressman Mickey Leland and, J and Jim For Florio. Uh, she's a graduate of Dickinson College, received her master's degree in public administration from Harvard University and a law degree from American University. Uh, next is uh, Paul Logie. Is it Logley. Uh, Logley, chairman of the board of the National District Attorneys Association. Mr. Logley uh, currently serves as, uh, is currently serving as an elected state's attorney in Winnebago County, Illinois, where he also serves as Vice President of the County Bar Association. Prior to his current position, he served as an Associate Judge for the 17th Judicial Circuit in Illinois and also as a member of the Governor's Commission on Gangs in Illinois. He's a graduate of Loris College 
and the University of Illinois College of Law. Our final witness will be Tenny, Mr. Tenny Gross, Executive Director of the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence in Providence, Rhode Island. Prior to holding his current position, he served as a program coordinator for the Youth Focused Community Initiative in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and a senior streetwalker for the city of Boston. Is it As I was saying, as a senior street worker <laughs> for the city of Boston, and as also a first, <clears throat> I've got to get these bifocals straight, <laughs> worker for the city of Boston, and also first sergeant in the Israeli Army Reserves. He received his Master of Theology Studies degree from Harvard University, Bachelor of Fine Arts degrees from Tufts University, and the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Now, each of the witnesses has a written statement which will be made as part of the record in its entirety. I would ask each witness to summarize his or her testimony in five minutes or less and to help stay within that time period. You have a little light gizmo which will start off green and go to amber uh, at a, when uh, it's time to start wrapping up and then it will go to red, nothing um, draconian will happen when it turns to red, but we would appreciate it if you would wrap up at that time. I will begin with Professor Elliott. Uh, Chairman Scott and uh, other distinguished members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and to talk with you. I'm the director of the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence at the University of Colorado and the editor of the Blueprints for Violence Prevention series, which is a series of model violence prevention programs that meet a very high scientific standard, uh, good enough that we could implement those programs on a national level. Um, we've looked at over 600 violence prevention programs, and out of those 600 programs, 75 to 80 percent of those programs have no credible evaluation. Of the others that do have a credible evaluation, a majority of those don't work. That is, the evidence that we have suggests that they're not effective. Fortunately, we have also, a number of programs, not enough, but we have a number of programs that are very effective and have very good effect sizes. That is, they can really have a significant effect upon violence and drug use and delinquency. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, we also find a few programs that are actually harmful, that are doing more harm than good. So the first recommendation I would like to make to the committee is that we deal with this huge expenditure of money invested in programs for which we have no idea whether they work or not. That means we either need to mandate the use of uh, effective programs, uh, research effective programs, um, or uh, we need to invest in evaluations of those programs uh, to continue to fund programs that we have no knowledge about whether they work or not is not a good idea, particularly when we know in some cases, although well-intended, they actually do harm. The ethics of delivering programs requires that we know whether those programs are effective or not. Secondly, um, I would like to recommend that we stop funding the programs that we know don't work. That is, of those programs that we've looked at where the evidence is compelling that they don't work, we need to stop funding those programs. And there are a number of those programs, unfortunately, which we are continuing to fund. The traditional DARE programs, shock probation programs, waivers out of the juvenile system and into the adult criminal system uh, all have either no effect or negative effects. And we need to stop investing our dollars in those kinds of programs. Third recommendation I would like to make is that whenever it's possible, uh, we should mandate that federal funds be used for um, effective programs. Um, the evaluation uh, or invested in the evaluation of promising programs to bring them up to the level that they can be implemented on a wide scale with certainty. Um, this will not require any major increase in funding. It involves, first of all, a reallocation of the dollars which we are currently spending the vast majority of which right now are going into programs that aren't effective. If we reallocate those dollars, that's the first way that we can 
implement good programs without increasing, increasing the necessary funding. Secondly, if we are funding evidence-based programs that meet a high standard, they do not need to have outcome evaluations, and we save money with respect to evaluation dollars. Those programs have been demonstrated effective at a level, and they're continuing evaluations of them. So local, local um, agencies do not need to engage in evaluation if they're using evidence-based programs. Third, these programs are so cost-effective that they will be paying for themselves in a very short period of time. The state of Washington has done an analysis in which they looked at a very modest portfolio of these evidence-based programs and have demonstrated that within four years, those programs are paying for themselves. They estimate it would cost $60 million to implement that portfolio statewide. And in four years, the taxpayer, the taxpayer benefits and savings would equal $60 million. At 10 years, the taxpayer savings from reduction in crime costs would be $180 million. And 20 years later, the savings would be $480 million for a $60 million investment in evidence-based programs. These programs are also very cost-effective. If we look at a, a model program like life skills training, which can reduce the onset of illicit substance use by 50 to 70 percent, that program, if we were to put that program in every middle school in this country, it would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $550 million. That program could cut the onset of illicit drug use 50 to 70 percent. That $550 million represents one and a half percent of our current spending on drug control. And finally, I would simply like to recommend that we establish a federal standard for what it means to be certified as an evidence-based program. A lot of confusion right now because the standard used on all of these lists which are available is very, very different. We need a standard. There is a federal working group on the federal collaboration of what works which has proposed the standard and I recommend that you look at that standard carefully. It's an excellent standard and it would resolve all of this confusion about what it means to be an effective, uh, effective program. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and to be a part of this panel. And I also apologize, I had a cold last week and my voice is still not what it was. As part of my testimony, I provided the subcommittee with a Chapin Hall issue brief that I wrote three months ago with my friend and colleague, Howard Snyder, of the National Center for Juvenile Justice. In that report, titled Too Soon to Tell, or Too Soon to Tell, Deciphering Recent Trends in Youth Violence, we reviewed the past 30 years of data about youth crime, including national arrest estimates based on the FBI's juvenile arrest data for 2005, which is still the most recent year for which national data are available. When we looked at trends through 2005, we found that it is too soon to predict a national increase in violent crime. Overall, crime remains at a 30-year low. According to the crime victimization surveys conducted by the U.S. Department of Justice, an American's chances of being the victim of a violent crime are still lower than at any point since the 1970s. Violent youth crime has increased at the national level, but only slightly. Between 2004 and 2005, the violent crime arrest rate for youth under age 18 grew by just 1%. The total increase amounted to 12 new violent arrests for every 100,000 juveniles in the population. This is about 1 20th what it would take for violent crime to return to the level of 1994, the most recent peak in violent crime. In other words, we would have to see the same increase for 19 more years before we would return to the scale of violence seen just a little more than 10 years ago. Obviously, we should not wait 19 years to respond to rising crime rates, but it is too soon to characterize the recent data as a national trend. What the data do suggest is that we have a number of cities and probably neighborhoods within cities that are starting to experience rising serious violence. The question for policymakers is how should we respond to these increases? At some point in every conversation about violent youth crime, someone will make the observation that to truly ensure public safety, we have to intervene earlier with youthful offenders. We cannot wait until a young person is already involved in serious violent crime and then try to stop it. Waiting is not only ineffective, it is expensive. 
I've heard this throughout my 25-year career in juvenile justice. I am sure everyone here has heard it. Many of you have probably said it at one time or another. Why don't we ever seem to make good on this promise? Why are we still unable to intervene effectively with young people as soon as they become involved in crime? I don't believe it's a matter of resources, that we can't afford to do it. We have decades of research showing us that high quality early intervention actually saves money. <clears throat> I think we fail to intervene early and effectively with youthful offenders because we continue to base our policies and programs on the wrong theories. For some reason, we seem to believe the best way to change the behavior of a 14-year-old is to use fear and domination. We use the threat of punishment to instill fear and then a series of increasing restrictions to establish dominance over youth. Certainly, there are some young offenders for whom this is the only feasible approach, but fortunately, that number is very small. For the vast majority of young people involved in crime, this is simply the wrong approach. We also apparently believe that young people who commit crimes are defective and that they need to be fixed by professional therapists, social workers, and psychiatrists. Much of what passes for intervention in the juvenile justice system today is based on a deficit model of adolescent behavior. Whether it is family therapy, drug treatment, anger management training, our first response to young offenders seems to be fix their pathology. Again, for some youth, therapy may be exactly what they need, but for many juveniles, and I would argue most in the juvenile justice system, this is just bad theory. Criminologists will tell you that all people are capable of committing crime given the right circumstances. The impulse to take advantage of other people is nearly universal. The critical question is not why are some people criminals. The critical question is why are most young people not criminals? Researchers have started to answer this question by identifying the protective factors and social assets that reduce the young person's chances of getting caught up in crime. We are learning that youth with positive and supportive relationships are less likely to engage in crime, violence, and substance abuse. We are also finding that being rewarded for learning and trying out new skills helps to keep young people attached to conventional institutions such as family, school, and work. And we are discovering that just like everyone else, young people value their communities when their communities value them. In other words, youth are less likely to get involved in crime when they participate in community affairs and when they have a voice in public dialogue. All of these lessons are now known as positive youth development or the youth development approach. Using the youth development approach with young offenders makes obvious common sense. It is essentially an effort to import the benefits of a middle class upbringing into high risk and distressed neighborhoods. The youth development approach suggests that even poor and disadvantaged youth should experience the social bonding that comes from having an adult mentor, from knowing success in school, and from being involved in civic activities, sports, music, and the arts. If we had a juvenile justice system that brought these assets into the lives of more young people, we might be able to head off the next wave of rising youth violence and make our communities safer. Certainly, we'll always, we will always need a justice system that deals aggressively with dangerous youth, but we should also want a system that responds effectively to young offenders before they are violent. Developing this sort of juvenile justice system is hard work, but thankfully research shows that it will be cost effective. Early intervention does pay. One strategy that we know does not pay in fact, the most expensive form of juvenile justice is delay and punish, where we put off doing anything serious and meaningful with a young offender until he or she does something truly horrible. Yet that is still the most common form of juvenile justice system we have today. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the discussion. If I could have the PowerPoint, please. My name is Lawrence Sherman, and I'm grateful for the... Uh, my name is Lawrence Sherman, and I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss the 100,000 murders of Americans on the streets of our cities since 9-11, 2001, a problem that uh, I'm delighted this committee is addressing, especially with its focus on youth and gang violence. What I'd like to focus on is what we've found in Philadelphia and appears to be true in many other cities, which is that homicide is heavily concentrated among people who are already under court supervision. Uh, much of my data pertains just to the adult probation and parole department, but if we add pretrial supervision, uh, youth probation, state parole uh, boards, um, we estimate that as many as three out of four murders in the city of Philadelphia uh, may be committed by people who are under court supervision. And what I'd like to propose is that this committee uh, offer legislation that would create a federal grants and aid program to support probation, parole, and pretrial services agencies that would undertake an evidence-based approach to the prediction and prevention of homicide 
within people on their caseload. Uh, th this uh, problem includes both victims. Um, if um, I could get the number, I think we'll see that the 16% um, of the murder victims in Philadelphia last year were on adult probation at the time. 22% of the murder arrests in Philadelphia were of people who were on adult probation at the time. This doesn't include state parole or, or juvenile uh, probation. Um, and what we may find is that if we uh, look for the needles in the haystack among the 52,000 cases uh, under adult uh, probation, uh, to look for the 108 victims and offenders uh, uh, identified in 2006, uh, we will see that most of them were predictable. And predictable by a, um, a realization of the fact that the 3% of, of that group is eventually going to be charged with murder or attempted uh, murder, and that with uh, new advanced data mining techniques and supercomputers uh, coming down in price, uh, it's now possible for every community supervision agency in the country to do what Professor Richard Burke has done, and we recruited him to Philadelphia from UCLA uh, precisely to help us work on this problem, um, which uh, I think we can illustrate best with the, um, uh, the key predictors that uh, start with uh, something that's already been mentioned, and that is age at first arrest, uh, at, at arrest that is, that is prosecuted as an adult by direct file to, uh, to adult course, courts, uh, along with current age, those seem to be the two biggest factors in predicting who is likely to be charged with murder or attempted murder while on probation uh, or parole with the county adult uh, system uh, in Philadelphia. And um, if I could just uh, focus uh, the committee's attention on the age at first adult prosecution, whether or not the offender is convicted, uh, the younger that age the more likely it is that um, this person, when they go on adult probation, will be charged with murder or attempted murder uh, within a several year uh, time frame. So starting with age 14, which is uh, absolutely the highest risk of, of murder, controlling for other factors that we have uh, in this model, uh, we see a rapid falling off with people being charged at the older age. But it's precisely, as Mr. Butts has said, it's precisely at those early ages that what we do is delay and we try to uh, uh, come to uh, some other uh, accommodation or even uh, fail to get a, a conviction or an adjudication because the witnesses uh, won't come. If we could uh, uh, say that uh, what this graph tells us is that 70 percent of all murders or attempted murders were committed by people who were charged as adults uh, before the age of 21 and 40 percent of them were committed by people who in their previous life were charged as adults before the age of 18. Um, another way of looking at this is the, uh, uh, the falling likelihood of being charged with homicide based on age. So the committee's focus on youth is absolutely right. Um, and uh, the problem is that the juvenile justice system cuts it off at age 18, whereas the risk is really heavily concentrated under 21, 25. The youth violence reduction partnerships in Philadelphia have set actually a 25-year definition of, of youth. Uh, which is consistent with that graph showing us that uh, uh, offenders uh, committing a murder uh, on probation uh, over age 45 in a very large sample is zero. Uh, but um, uh, of those who are under 20, 15 percent were going to go on to be charged with murder or, or attempted murder. And so what um, I, I would like to do is to agree with Dr. Butts's uh, assertion that most people in the juvenile justice system do not need uh, the kind of intensive therapy that we have found that the people who are most likely to kill or be killed uh, need because they're suffering from undiagnosed and untreated post-traumatic stress disorder, they have chronic depression, they have anxiety disorder, they have things that are well known to be treatable within clinical psychology, but they're not getting that kind of treatment. And what Philadelphia has done is to create both a special unit to provide those kinds of services uh, and a, um, a randomized controlled trial to find out whether that approach is effective uh, in not only reducing homicide and other serious crime, but also reducing in the incarceration rate, uh, which is very costly to the state and, uh, and of course, a waste of, of human potential. If we had a federal grants program that would uh, reward through a peer review process, no earmarks, uh, those proposals that uh, develop uh, an effective statistical prediction model and offer a randomized trial to evaluate the effects of their program, we would not be guaranteed to lower the homicide rate, but we would be guaranteed to develop a robust body of evidence on what works and what doesn't work to try to prevent homicide by young people. Thank you for this opportunity.
I'd like to begin by offering my sincere thanks to Chairman Scott and to the committee as a whole for holding this hearing and allowing me to be a part of it. Individual lives, the trajectory of families and communities, in a very real way, the success of the American experiment are at stake here, for this issue is infused with race, however much we might wish it were not. Getting this right means a new way of thinking and acting. I'm now persuaded that we could put 100 times more gang members in prison or fund 100 times the number of prevention programs, and that would not work either. My simplest and most profound message is that we know today how to address this problem in a way that saves lives, reduces incarceration, strengthens communities, bridges racial divides, and improves the lives of offenders and ex-offenders. In 1996, the famous Boston miracle cut youth homicide by two-thirds and homicide citywide by half. What Boston did was both simple and profound. Boston assembled law enforcement, social service providers, and community actors, including my old friend Tenney, into a new partnership that created sustained relationships with Boston's gangs. The partners stood together and spoke with one voice face to face with gang members. That the violence was wrong and had to stop, that the community needed them alive and out of prison and with their loved ones, that help was available to all who would take it, and that violence would be met with clear, predictable, and certain consequences. The new approach worked with an existing law using existing resources. The results were shockingly different. The first face-to-face -face meeting with gang members took place in May of 1996. By the fall, the streets were almost quiet. The city averaged around 100 homicides a year through mid-1996. In 1999, it had 31. The approach has worked just as well in jurisdictions all over the country. The nature of these interventions does not allow the strongest random assignment evaluation designs, but in Chicago, a sophisticated quasi-experimental evaluation by University of Chicago and Columbia researchers of a Justice Department project showed homicide reductions in violent neighborhoods of 37%. When Richmond, in Chairman Scott's district, had its first offender call in, former Virginia U.S. Attorney Paul McNulty, now Deputy Attorney General, traveled back to Richmond to address the gang members personally. Last year at this time, there had been 15 homicides in Richmond. This year, there have been four. I'm working with a team in Cincinnati in Congressman Chabot's district and with the U.S. Attorney in Milwaukee in Congressman Sensenbrenner's district. And I will say to them what I have said to their constituents. We are now essentially certain from years of experience that if the work is done seriously, the results will follow. Not all jurisdictions have implemented the strategies properly. Many that have, including Boston, the first and still best known site, have let effective interventions fail. This has highlighted the need for attention to institutionalization and sustainability. Frameworks for adapting the strategy to the most demanding jurisdictions, such as Los Angeles, need to be developed. But the record is increasingly compelling. In the most recent strand of this work, begun in High Point, North Carolina, in Congressman Coble's district, we for the first time faced squarely the toxic racial tension that saturates these issues. In High Point, law enforcement spoke honestly to communities that enforcement was not succeeding, that they knew that, that they had never meant to do harm through relentless enforcement, but they had come to realize that they had. Communities looked inward and realized that in their anger over historic and present ills, they had not made it clear to their own young people that gang and drug activity was wrong and deeply damaging to the community. Both law enforcement and community came to understand that what they were dealing with was not so much depraved individuals as it was out of control peer, group, and street dynamics. So when the partnership met with High Point's drug dealers, the community voice was clear and amazingly powerful. Scores of community members, including many immediate family, told the dealers that they were loved, needed, vital to the future of the community, would be helped, but were doing wrong, hurting themselves, hurting others, and had to stop. Overwhelmingly, they have stopped. This is transformational. Gang violence and drug crime is an obscenity, but so is mass incarceration. It is important that at-risk youth get help, but it is equally important that seasoned offenders get help. It is important to have firm law enforcement, but it is even more important to have firm community standards. It is important that law enforcement take action when the dangerous will not stop, and that the community supports them when they do. We now know that all of that can be brought to pass, within existing law, within existing resources, and remarkably quickly. The demand for these interventions nationally is enormous. These demands cannot be met. All of us involved in this work are swamped with pleas for help that we cannot answer. There is no larger framework in place to go to scale to help localities understand how to implement these approaches, 
learn from the constant refinements and innovations that occur at the local level, address key issues such as sustainability, and enhance the state of the art. The federal government should make creating and supporting that framework a priority. We've learned profound lessons about how to address gangs, gang violence, the drug-driven crime that invariably travels alongside, and blessedly, how to begin to address the racial divides that undergird and perpetuate all of it and make us all less than we should be. We can do better. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism and Homeland Security, thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. My name is James Corwin. I've been a member of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department since 1979 and the Chief of Department since 2004. As a law enforcement leader, I've been committed to community-oriented policing approaches and problem-solving in Kansas City. This approach has served our city well, especially the year before last when we faced a spike in homicide, going from 91 in 2004 to 127 in 2005. The homicide rate went back down in 2006. Groups of individuals, typically neighborhood-based groups, rather than traditional gangs like Crips, Bloods, and MS-13, were involved in many of those homicides. That's why I'm grateful for this opportunity to share information with you about what works to reduce youth and gang violence. I'm also a member of the Fight Crime Investing Kids, an organization of more than 3,000 police chiefs, sheriffs, and prosecutors, and victims of violence who have come together to take a hard-nosed look at the research on what keeps kids from becoming criminals. As a police chief, I know there is no substitute for tough law enforcement. Yet law enforcement leaders like myself know better than anyone that we cannot arrest and prison our way out of this crime problem. Fortunately, research and our experiences show that targeted investments that help kids get a, get a good start in life and to intervene effectively to redirect juveniles onto different paths can prevent crime and make our communities safer. To reduce crime in our communities, we should begin at the beginning. Beginning at the beginning means offering services to new moms, such as voluntary in-home parent coaching and ensuring that kids have access to quality early education and child care, after school programs during the hours of 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., Prime time for juvenile crime on school days can also help in preventing crime. Law enforcement is doing the best job we can do to deal with juvenile crime when it happens and to make sure dangerous juveniles are taken off the streets. Most juveniles arrested are not likely to become serious offenders. Nationally, six in ten juveniles brought before a juvenile court for the first time will not return to court on other charge. In recent years, there have been approximately 100,000 juveniles in custody nationwide. The vast majority of these troubled youth will, will, be, will be released back into the community with, our, with the expected prime crime years ahead in them and facing a rate rearrest rates of up to 75%. But it doesn't have to be that way. A significant amount of the research has identified several effective approaches to help young offenders avoid committing further crimes, thereby enhancing public safety. For the most dangerous young offenders, especially those who are involved in violent gangs, a combination of intensive police supervision expedited sanctions for repeat violence, and expedited access to jobs, drug treatment, and other services, a carrot and stick approach has shown in a number of cities that it can cut homicides among violent offenders in high crime neighborhoods. In Chicago, for example, in the carrot and stick approach to area, there was a 37% drop in quarterly homicide rates when the project was implemented, while the decline in homicide in another similar neighborhood during the same period was 18%. Simply warehousing high-risk offenders during their time in custody is not adequate. They need to be required to do the hard work of confronting and changing their antisocial beliefs and behaviors. Aggression replacement therapy, ART, can teach teens to stop and consider the consequences of their actions, to think of other ways of responding to interpersonal problems, and to consider how their actions will affect others. Young people in Brooklyn gangs without ART services had four times the number of arrests as similar young gang members receiving ART. For offenders who do not need high security lockup, individual replacement, or multidimensional treatment foster care, MTC, home can be used. Foster care may sound like a pass for juveniles who should be paying a more severe price for their crime they committed, but for teens who have often used to running the streets and who see a, see a month in custody as just another chance to socialize with delinquent friends or to learn new criminal behaviors, this is a more controlled experience and a tough intervention. The MTFC approach cuts the average number of repeat arrests for serious delinquent juveniles in half. MTFC saves the public an average of over 77,000 for every juvenile treated. Similar effective cost-effective models can be implemented in communities or functional family therapy program and multi-systemic therapy. 
approximately 500,000 juveniles a year could benefit from evidence based like FFT, MST, MTFC, and only 34,000 are currently being served. Here are the steps that Congress can take to implement those proven effective crime prevention strategies. Implement effective research proven proven strategies such as voluntary in-home parenting coaching, quality early childhood care, and education and bullying prevention programs. Ensure that any legislation to address gang violence provides funding for communities to implement comprehensive, coordinated carrot and stick responses. Enact and fund legislation, says the Second Chance Act, to enable juvenile ex-offenders to successfully re-enter their communities. Reauthorize, strengthen, and increase funding for federal juvenile justice and delinquency prevention programs. Being tough on violent crime is critical. However, once a crime has been committed, neither police nor prisons can undo the agony of crime victim and repair the victim's shattered life. Thus, prevention and intervention programs that use research-based techniques to prevent further crime and critical tools for making our neighborhoods safer. I and my colleagues with Fight Crime Investing Kids, who are leaders of American law enforcement, are grateful for that the subcommittee is holding today's hearing, and we look forward to working with you in implementing these recommendations. Thank you. We've been joined by the gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Fernandez. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I want to thank you all for having me here today, and I'd also like to invite you all to the Latin American Youth Center, which is about a 20-minute cab ride here from Congress. So if you want to see a program that works, get in a cab, go 20 minutes north, and you'll be there. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Latin American Youth Center where I work. We, um, we've been in D.C. for over 30 years, and a little over a year ago, we opened three sites in Maryland. We are a community-based, multicultural, multilingual youth and family development center. We provide educational programs and tutoring to enable youth who are in school to stay in school and go on to college. For young people who have dropped out, we provide GED preparation and workforce training. We offer alternative to incarceration programs for youth inside the juvenile justice system and reentry programs for youth exiting it. Additionally, we provide counseling and substance abuse assistance foster care, and residential placement for youth in need of such services. Through our different programs, we serve about 3,000 youth annually. I think it's safe to say that many of our youth and young people are gang involved or have been gang involved at some point in their life. However, only a small number of our young people are involved in criminal activity. Let me explain. Many of our parents of our youth immigrated from the United States to find safety and a better way of life for their children. Upon arriving in the United States, Many of, the, of these parents find themselves needing to work two and three jobs just to make things, to make ends meet. Keeping the family clothed, fed, and housed becomes the priority. Unfortunately, this means that children are not provided proper supervision and schools don't pre are not prepared to meet this need. The lack of super supervision often leads to boredom, boredom and a sense of insecurity, which causes the children to join, join gangs. Joining a gang gives youth a and a group, of friends, a group of friends to hang out with and a sense of security, which they cannot get elsewhere in their lives. These kids are not super predators. They are young people looking for a sense of belonging. Most, most youth who are in gangs are not criminals. Having said this, I'm a former prosecutor from Manhattan and do believe that when a gang member gets involved in criminal activity, there needs to be decisive law enforcement response. Three and a half years ago, our neighborhood, Columbia Heights, D.C., where the, youth, where the youth center is located, was plagued with a spree of Latino gang-related murders. Law enforcement acted swiftly in their investigation of these cases and apprehended the, the perpetrators. Several of these young people are now serving life sentence. The law enforcement response a clear, sent a clear message to other gang-involved youth. If you commit crimes, you will be punished. During this gang crisis, both the community and the police realized they should not only respond to gang-related criminal activity, but should also work together to prevent it. As a result, the Gang Intervention Partnership, the GIP, was created. The GIP brings together police, probation officers, prosecutors, community-based and social service providers, and develops intervention strategies for youth who are at high risk of committing crimes. GIP has focused not just on reducing violent behavior, but on addressing the myriad of social and economic issues such as family, such as family situation, employment status, school attendance, peer relationships, and limited recreational opportunities, which can create environments that lead, violence, that lead to violence amongst young people. 
Gift's holistic approach marries prevention and interventions initiatives with intelligence gathering and law enforcement efforts, providing a new model for reducing gang violence. As a GIP community partner, the Latin American Youth Center has focused its efforts on outreach to gang-related youth, working closely with gang-involved young people to offer them educational, arts, recreational, and leadership programs, as well as other opportunities to help them live healthy lives and connect them with caring adults. From its inception, GIP has concentrated on a set of core strategies, conducting intense, intensive targeted police work and building on strong police community partnerships, providing targeted outreach to gang-related youth and their families, educating parents and community members, and improving and expanding access to service to critical families and, and strengthening and diversion. What often occurs in, in, in a community is, is that a community member will find out that a, young, that a youth is in some kind of trouble. The members of the GIP come together to ensure that the youth is supervised and he or, he or she is involved in structured activities. In instances where the youth has faced real security problems, arrangements have been made to place the youth in witness protection programs. This last fall, the GIP program was independently, independently evaluated by the Center for Youth Policy Research. The evaluations found that the GIP's comprehensive approach dramatically reduced Latino gang-related violence in D.C. Their findings cited that, that there has not been a Latino gang-related homicide in the District of Columbia since October 9, 2003. Our results are significant. In a four-year period prior to forming the, the GIP, there were 40 shootings and stabbings. 20 of those victims died. In the three years since the GIP has been developed, there has been five shootings and stabbings. Only one has led to a homicide. In, adu in addition to reducing violence, the evaluation found the GIP achieved each of its other four goals, decreasing gang membership, reducing the number of gang-related suspensions in targeted schools, increasing the involvement of at-risk youth in recreational and productive activities, and building community, community capacity and consciousness about gangs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Logie. Thank you, uh, and I want to thank you, Chairman Scott, on behalf of the National District Attorneys Association for this opportunity to present our concerns about gang violence and to share some thoughts on what we as America's prosecutors and you, the Congress, can do to counter uh, this growing threat to public safety. The views that I express today represent the views of our association and the beliefs of thousands of local and state prosecutors who have primary jurisdiction in the matter of violent crime and specifically in the area of youth and gang crime. I was privileged to testify before this very same committee uh, two years ago, uh, and I'm going to use some of that testimony as a basis for my uh, testimony today. Now, after hearing many of the members of this distinguished panel, there's not a whole lot new that we can add. There are some very fine programs out there that I think America's prosecutors are embracing. Many of those programs wouldn't work except for the involvement of local prosecutors. And so I want to disabuse anyone of the idea that I or any of the other local prosecutors are only concerned with trying and imprisoning gang members. Uh, to counter the gang problem, we need effective community partnerships to deter our children from becoming enamored with the gang life. While we need strong and effective criminal prosecutions, we also need those diversion programs to prevent young people from making bad decisions, getting into trouble, uh, bringing back those who have already started to make the bad decisions, gotten into trouble. And lastly, we need to develop meaningful re-entry programs so that those persons who have already been convicted and sent to prison uh, can somehow be reintegrated back into our societies with a chance to succeed. When I testified two years ago, based on recent federal reports, we estimated there were 731,000 gang members. Two years later, in the same report, and that's for the report for 2004, it appears uh, that there are now uh, uh, 760,000 gang members. And I heard a figure this morning from the chairman that it's estimated that today, 2007, there are about 850,000 gang members. So the problem continues to grow as we discuss this problem and, and try to define strategies. Uh, but numbers don't tell the full story. If you talk to any local prosecutor, you'd, you'd find out that more and more of the gang members 
are increasingly young, 12, 13 years old. We have an increasing problem with witness intimidation. Uh, people who do step forward to testify against gang crime uh, many times pay the price with their very lives. We see that gang members are now using technology more and more. They have their own websites. Major gangs have their own websites. Google up the gang names. Uh, we have disputes that have begun in our community, my, my jurisdiction of Rockford, Illinois, uh, where we think we got the situation kind of calmed down. Well, then the gang members use their pages on MySpace to further disrespect other gang members, uh, competing gang members, and the fight begins again. And what starts on MySpace erupts into violence uh, in the community. Uh, we see gangs out of Chicago moving into central Wisconsin with the Native Americans and developing new drug markets by introducing cheap drugs and then eventually uh, uh, raising the prices uh, when they get the, uh, the young members of the tribes in central Wisconsin addicted to drugs. Very effective marketing strategies. These are sophisticated organizations. Uh, we need the combined efforts of state, local, and federal law enforcement. Uh, but local prosecutors can lead community involvement. Uh, we are connected to the community. Uh, we can bring those resources together uh, and combine effective prosecution for those gang members who have already stepped over the line, but also mobilizing the community uh, to prevent it in the first place. Uh, we welcomed Mr. Kennedy to our jurisdiction just recently, and we are laying the groundwork for a program uh, that he described this morning within my jurisdiction. Uh, we, in our team effort, welcome the assistance from federal law enforcement, uh, the ATF, uh, ICE, Secret Service, FBI, the local U.S. Attorney's Office. And in fact, the local U.S. Attorney is working with us on Mr. Kennedy's program and helped to bring several of our local people down to the National Advocacy Center in Columbia, South Carolina for training just in that program. Uh, we could also uh, use uh, federal assistance uh, in the area of uh, preventing witness intimidation. Uh, we support, in principle, I believe we support specifically H.R. 933, introduced by Mr. Cummings, that would provide federal support for local efforts uh, to uh, protect uh, witnesses to violent crime. Uh, we need to be proactive in our communities to identify gang threats early and to respond decisively. Uh, as we testify, the gang, gang problem is growing. Uh, on behalf of America's prosecutors, uh, I and the National District Attorneys Association urge you to take steps to provide federal assistance to state efforts to fight our gang problems and to provide us with the resources to effectively prosecute and to protect uh, victims and the witnesses uh, to violent crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tenny Oded Gross. Um, it's a true honor to be here. Wish my parents were alive. Uh, my dad, after World War II, the first bar of chocolate was for an American GI. And I, my older sister used to take me to the American Embassy for the library every, every Tuesday uh, to borrow books. And I ended up marrying an American girl and uh, ended up working in uh, Boston for 10 years and now five years in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, what happens in this civilization matters a lot. This is the longest running democracy on the planet in history, in fact. The Athenian democracy lived a lot shorter. And it does concern a lot of us, the levels of violence that are absolutely astounding. It is actually safer to be an Israeli soldier in uniform in Lebanon than it is to be an African-American man in Washington, D.C. Uh, between the age of 17 to 40. That's a staggering, staggering statistic. Uh, we have lost in the last 25 years about 580,000 people to homicide, 10 Vietnam wars. Um, those are things that we live in. I dream of speaking to our elites at 3 in the morning at the emergency room when we are picking up the pieces. Uh, before I move on, I just want to introduce three of our street workers that we brought over from Providence to work at the Institute. Senior street worker A.J. Benton. Street worker David Cartagena and street worker Sal Montero, who have been seen the streets, have been involved with gangs, have been involved in violence, and are now legends and, and constantly called upon by educators, by social workers, by doctors, by police officers to mediate conflicts in the city. I 
I've studied in some very, very fine schools in this country, and I love philosophy, but what I will speak about today is from pure experience of 15 years in the trenches. In two cities now, particularly in Boston and in Providence, where I've worked, I've seen that a smart group of a partnership by a very motivated and concentrated group of people, like prevention, like a few academics, um, gang unit officers, clergy, and youth workers can make a huge amount of difference. When you bring these five groups together, you basically have the intelligence on the whole city, who is committing the violence. One of the efforts that David led in Boston was, initially the problem was 60,000 children. We narrowed it down to 1,200 gang members. 300 are hardcore. You see how it becomes my rational problem to tackle. Um, and then really we are the linebackers. We're really the ones who are every day trying to hit those conflicts, work on them, mediate them. Violence is very, very, very rarely random. It's between known people. So Philadelphia recently, by November 15th, I think I read in the Inquirer, picked up 5,000 guns and still homicide peaked over 400. We cannot just go after the guns. Someone is using it against someone they know. What we do in Providence now, we have perfected the Boston model. Uh, it's a more sophisticated one. Anytime there's a conflict in school, little things, we already jump on it. We have meetings like police comstat, where we look at the current conflicts. We assign them to street workers. Street workers know different gangs. They come from different gangs. They come from different sides of town. So we always, as opposed to the social worker model, where you know a client and you try to serve them, we actually know your enemy. The fact that Tenny now wants to go to college after he has inflicted pain on his city means nothing if my enemy doesn't let me do that. You need someone on the other side, and that's what we do. When I won out recently, about a year ago, a major shooter of an Asian gang said to, us, said to me, away from his crew in the park, he said, Tenny, I'm exhausted. I wish I could live in the suburbs. Well, David has worked with him in that year, and he has been taken away to Job Corps in another, in another state, removed from that environment, which is what he wanted. You keep him in that environment, he's going to continue to be a shooter. He has too many conflicts. So there is no cookie-cutter solution, but we do know the solutions now. It's going to take having practitioners. One of the things that I'm dazzled at when I come at 3 in the morning back from an emergency room and I have to wind down, I look on the Internet. We spend a lot of money on research. We spend a lot of money on pilot programs. We have no stamina. I wish we picked up a little bit from the Japanese and look a little bit at longer-term solutions. It's almost like sending the army to Iraq just through having researchers at the Pentagon. You need people in the trenches, and most of us work in programs I have the greatest support of the, of the mayor, the chief is on our board, the U.S. attorney has helped fund us, and it's still a massive struggle to fund 13 street workers. So th there are good programs, and I'm here on the panel with people I admire, and there's everywhere around the country great people, and we're all burning out. We aren't, we, there's nothing to sustain us. And so using Congress, actually, I also think to talk to our elite in the funding community and foundations, none of them really fund practitioners. They have moved now to change policies. They have moved now to pilot programs. We need to change the model of funding. There's people who need to be in this field and you cannot keep them. It's an anomaly to have someone like me with a master's from Harvard staying in this field at 41 with no retirement. It's an anomaly. It shouldn't be. We need to rebuild, if I would suggest research as well, is to have a pract practical research that what will it take to build the infrastructure of youth workers around the country? Well, rec centers will have a library on the second floor. There will be a jazz orchestra where the kids learn to do it. There will be a theater program. We need to bring civilization back to the neighborhoods where violence happens. We have... I was stunned in Providence that only one full-time person is in a rec center. And the only training they had the last 20 years is CPR. And those are the people we want to turn the attitudes of our kids. We are absolutely shooting ourselves in the leg. I have to stop here. Thank you. I want to thank all of our witnesses for um, tremendous testimony. And uh, I recognize myself for the uh, first round of questioning. Um, 
Mr. Elliott, you mentioned um, uh, the need for research. Where is the research done? Uh, Mr. Gross mentioned uh, where some of it could be done. Would it be colleges, National Institute for of Science, or where should we be looking for for research? Well, in the area of uh, violence reduction, of course, I think that research ought to be in the Justice Department, and um, Department of Education is doing some of that, but I think the primary location would be in the, de in the Department of Justice. Um, and you know, a lot of the work uh, currently going on is in the Department of Justice. The National Science Foundation, I think, could also be funding um, youth of general youth development kind of programs like uh, Dr. Butts uh, talked about. But when we're talking about violence and crime reduction, I think that research ought to be in the Justice Department. And you mentioned several things that didn't work. Uh, your testimony specifically mentions waivers to adult court. Now, what is the research on that? The research on that suggests that uh, waivers to the adult court increase the risk of victimization for those uh, adolescents who have been put into the adult criminal system as compared to the juvenile system. There is a, a greater risk of reoffending when they get out. Uh, and they, um, that there's also some evidence for discriminatory processing with respect to which kids get waived or transferred and which kids don't when that's left up to the prosecuting attorneys. Now, is that statement uh, based on control groups or because you would expect the more serious offenders to be waived to adult court? So you might be talking about apples and oranges or are you talking about the um, modest risk people if they're treated in adult court, they're more likely to offend? Now, the studies have, in fact, controlled for that issue. They are not randomized controlled trials, which would be the, the best evidence, but they are quasi-experimental trials in which they have matched uh, the, the control group with the experimental group with respect to the seriousness of the fence. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Butch, you indicated um, that you need to let me ask it another way. Uh, in terms of what you do to the juveniles that are here today, uh, what does that do, whatever you do to them, what does that do for the next cohort of juveniles in terms of uh, what they may be doing or what trajectory they're on? I think you heard some of the other speakers refer to uh, the changing the culture uh, at the neighborhood level, at the, certainly at the family level. Um, Everyone you're exposed to as you're, as you're coming up as a young person influences you. And to the extent we can surround people, young people, with positive pro-social adults who see a role for family, who have jobs, who have faith in their own futures, um, youth will pick up on that attitude and start to adopt it themselves. So stopping, you know, you've referred to the phrase before as um, closing down the pipeline, um, reducing the number of people that a young person is exposed to who advocate and enjoy a criminal lifestyle is critical for making those cultural changes. And if you don't change the trajectory, does it matter for the next cohort what you've done to the last cohort? The trajectory of an individual? Right. Uh, if young people are headed towards prison rather than college, if you don't do anything about that trajectory, what can we reasonably expect the next cohort to end up? Um, well, that's, uh, some people refer to the, uh, the little brother effect to explain the declining crime during the late 90s. Um, and that, that um, simply put, is when you're 12 years old and you see your 18-year-old brother shot and killed, go off to prison, um, and a lot of your brother's friends are doing the same thing, it changes you as a 12-year-old. And some people theorize that that is why um, that and the many other factors, including the decline in, in crack use, um, contributed to the overall decline. So the whole pipeline effect, um, you know, stopping things early um, and reaching kids when they're young is uh, utmost importance. And what kinds of things actually make a difference in that trajectory? Well, what I was suggesting in my, in my statement was that we pay attention to common sense. I mean, none of us are here threatening each other with bodily harm right now, and that's not because we were surrounded by a team of psychiatrists when we were 13 years old. It's because we learned to play by the rules, we learned to enjoy the benefits of living in society, and to respect one another. Those are pretty simple lessons. Um, and you don't need um, skilled therapeutic professionals to do that. We rely upon skilled therapeutic professionals because that's our funding mechanism and that's how we can create systems of intervention. Um, it's much harder to create neighborhood-based, volunteer-based, 
um, pro-social activities and, and groups for young people. Um, but if we were going to focus on common sense and create uh, service networks which made sense, I think that's what we would do. It just it takes a long time and you need good community-based workers like um, some of the young men sitting behind us. Thank you. Um, Professor Sherman, you indicated your entire research identified a high risk, a group of, at high risk of offending. Uh, with those on supervision, are there things we could do while they're on supervision to reduce the risk that they'll offend? Mr. Chairman, there's a, a wide range of things we could do. What we haven't done is to uh, test the matching of certain responses to people with certain kinds of diagnoses. We, we do have some ideas like uh, across the board um, uh, provide uh, frequent checks to make sure that these people at very high risk and and I, I should say uh, with the new models we can identify the people who are 42 times more likely to be accurately forecast uh, to commit a murder or attempted murder than the average person on probation. So by, by focusing on a very tiny portion of that group, uh, we, we could then say even within that portion, are, does everybody need to be monitored for whether they're carrying guns? And that's currently one of the strategies that's being used that hasn't been evaluated carefully. For those who have post-traumatic stress disorder because they've seen their brother shot or they've, uh, they've seen their parents uh, fighting in very violent ways, uh, does treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder reduce their likelihood of killing somebody? For people who are chronically depressed, does treatment for depression reduce their post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, again, these are not things that you, I think, should be doing across the board uh, in either the juvenile or the adult system, but where uh, for the tiny fraction who, based on their prior record, are at very high risk, um, we, we could be said to be underserving them in terms of their mental health needs. And, uh, um, and not every city has a gang problem. Um, Philadelphia really doesn't have the evidence of the kind of thing that we're hearing about in Providence or Boston. Uh, so indeed, we may be able to help these uh, folks uh, get their lives together, get into uh, the high school completion. Some are in community college right now. Um, uh, give them some parent training. You know, there are fathers out there, as well as David Old's mothers, uh, who are raising kids, and we've got some of them in this program. Um, and if in every way the probation officer, possibly even on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, can help to turn their lives around, that, that could save an enormous amount of money, uh, if not in, in terms of gunshot wounds uh, uh, at uh, over $100,000 per injury, uh, then in terms of 35000 a year in prison for possibly 40 years. Um, we, we don't know exactly what to do, but I think the, the progress we've made now that would support creation of a federal grant program is that we have a much better idea where to focus these, these efforts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, first of all, again, I want to thank all of you for being here and thank you for what you're doing. And with the possible caveat that Mr. Elliott may tell us that one of your programs is harmful, we just appreciate all of them that you're doing. and. Um, uh, we, I want to just say a couple of things at the beginning because we hear a lot of buzz phrases and buzz words and, and, and let's just make clear for the record that nobody here thinks you can arrest or incarcerate your way out of the gang problem. I've heard that language. Nobody seriously believes that. Uh, nobody thinks that uh, abusive or illegal law enforcement activities work well. None, none of us think that. Nobody thinks we should not have a comprehensive program to address the gang problem which includes law enforcement tools and prevention programs. Nobody thinks the federal government can pass a single act that will deal with all the components of gang crime, nor should we. That's not, you know, that's not what we're about. Our goal is trying to strike a balance between what the federal government can and should do, what the state governments can and should do, what communities can and should do, and what um, the private sector can and should do. Uh, just give you a couple of examples. One of the most popular gang leaders that I read about in the 70s was a guy named Nicky Cruz, who was a gang leader at 19. Uh, Teen Challenge converted him to, to a faith program. Nicky's spoken now to 40 million people about self-improvement around the world. I mean, that was, some, that was a winner. Federal government, Mr. Chairman would say, we shouldn't get involved in helping those kind of programs. Uh, just this past week, I was at a community center that combined a library, rec center, um, to help prevent gangs and juvenile crime. Wonderful program. So, so we think those programs are 
great. What we're trying to do is say, what should the federal government be doing and how should we be doing it? Now, Mr. Elliott, I, I looked at um, your testimony, and um, one of the things that I looked at was the bio that you gave to us. And one of the things the chairman and, and the chairman of the committee has encouraged us to do is oversight. And as I was looking at the studies and the grants that you just listed down here, and I'm sure there were a lot more that you were the principal investigator of, they totaled over $38,526,000 in grant programs just to programs that you listed that you were principal investigator. That's a lot of money to research and, and evaluate uh, programs. And after doing that, uh, the conclusion that I read in your written testimony, I just want to read it back to you, that you identified over 600 programs that claim to prevent or deter violence, drug use, or delinquent behavior, and less than 20 have any rigorous evaluation. Is that, was that your statement? 20%. 20%, I'm sorry, 20%. The other testimony that you had written statement was, the fact remains that most of the resources currently committed to the prevention and control of youth violence, drug use, and delinquency at both national and local levels has been invested in unproven programs based on questionable assumptions and delivered with little consistency or quality control. A fair statement? Correct. Um, and then the other thing that you indicated was that this was a complex behavioral problem when we're looking at gangs that includes these things, family, neighborhood, peer group, and the media. These were what you listed. Was that, were they accurate components according to your testimony? Yes. And, and, and then you also said any positive changes in the individual's behavior achieved in the treatment setting are quickly lost when the, loose, when the youth returns home to his, her family, neighborhood, and old friends. Um, so basically, we're looking at a situation where all of those components um, are influential in what happens with any particular program that we have, uh, how strong the family unit is, what the neighborhood looks like, what the peer groups are, how the media responds. Fair statement? E each of those contexts does contribute to the, the incidents or the likelihood of violence. But we have to look at each of, each of those components when we're trying to measure gang activity, correct? Correct. Um, the other thing is we've had testimony before our committee, and forgive me for being quick, I only have five minutes. Um, we, we've had testimony before our committee that the number one gang problem in the United States today, according to the Attorney General, is MS-13. That's his testimony, whether we agree with it or disagree with it. And then we've had further testimony that between 60 and 85 percent of the members of many of the uh, MS-13 groups uh, are here illegally. Can you tell me from that $38 million of evaluation on the programs that you've had and your examination of these prevention programs, what prevention programs have you found that effectively works to stop gang activity from those individuals who are here illegally on the worst gangs that we have in the country today? I'm not sure I can address that specific gang and those specific uh, situations. Uh, but we have two programs, for example, that we know are very effective in working with deep end offenders, and that's multi-systemic family therapy. And are, are they for illegal? Illegal? They would work for illegals. Okay. Uh, there are a number of programs which have been validated to work with various ethnic populations. Some programs, unfortunately, have been validated only with respect to the, the, the majority population, so you have to be careful when you look at the program to see but those are two programs, for example, that have demonstrated the effectiveness of working with different uh, racial and ethnic groups and have been effective in working with kids like the kids that are in uh, gangs in general. I, don't, I, I, not, I can't speak specifically to the MS-13 group. And my time is out, but in, that's one of the dilemmas we have with having so many people in the panel. We can't get to everybody to ask all the questions we want to have, and hopefully we'll have several rounds. To do this. only thing I'd follow up with you, if you could submit to us at some point in time in writing from your evaluation, specifically the programs that you have found to be effective in working with the illegal group of people that are here on groups like MS-13 and some of the other groups that seem to be so popular. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by the gentlelady from California, Ms. Waters. Your question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize. I'm uh, in financial services, and I was not able to be here earlier. Um, and I must also admit I've not had an opportunity to read uh, all of the testimony that is being presented here this morning. 
Uh, but I wanted to come over uh, for several reasons. One is, as you know, um, I urge and encourage that we uh, focus some attention on the gang problem uh, in America and uh, shared with you the seriousness of the great gang problem in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, I have not uh, read all of the testimony. I do know about one of the programs that uh, simply talked about uh, law enforcement, community leaders, et cetera, coming together uh, and um, addressing uh, gang members and uh, somehow either convincing them or threatening them, maybe both, uh, and it having some great impact. Um, I have a lot of experience working with gangs. Uh, started many years ago in some of the largest public housing projects in the greater Los Angeles area, the Nickerson Gardens uh, housing project um, and the uh, Imperial Courts, Jordan Downs, the Pueblos, Gonzalez housing projects. These are areas where uh, we had Crips and Bloods, Eight Trays, uh, Grape Street, all of the notorious gangs. Uh, of the South Central Los Angeles area. And uh, I think I've learned a few things. Um, I've learned that you cannot simply deal with the problems of gangs, with, um, with police uh, enforcement, and just simply getting tough and uh, locking up people. Uh, it does not work. It creates a lot more resentment uh, because oftentimes the police um, don't know a gang member from uh, Miss Johnson's son who is not a gang member that uh, is in school every day and happens to be at the laundromat and ill-informed uh, and ill-trained police officers uh, just see all black youth uh, in the same light and they not only apprehend and arrest but create uh, a lot of uh, confrontation and friction and other kinds of things. Now. Our communities have marched, they have prayed, they've got ministers involved, but I have found through a program that I started uh, with the Wagner Pizer discretionary monies that came from the federal government to the state when I was in the state legislature, I created a program for public housing projects. It was a program that I simply sat at my kitchen table and wrote. And we took this discretionary money went into the public housing projects. And we put flyers out, we walked the neighborhoods, and we convinced the public housing authorities to give us space where we opened offices and we used their gymnasiums for the programs that I ran for almost 10 years. We took this money, we took this free space, we walked the neighborhood and we convinced of city government who was running the private industry councils at that time, if any of you remember the so-called jo job training programs of private industry councils uh, that did not touch inside these public housing projects. Many cities do not afford the services to some of the poorest areas and certainly to public housing projects that they should be affording. They act as if they're not in their cities. And so the, the job training programs never reached. And so I started these programs because young people, mostly young black males at that time, were just hanging every day in public housing projects. They didn't really live there because they, were, they did live there. They were not on the rolls because of the policies of federal government. They lived with girlfriends and grandmothers and wherever they could because they didn't have jobs and they didn't have homes. And so the government, we all pretend that they don't live there. We recruited them in the gymnasiums, and I had a program where, in my, the way I structured it, we met about um, four days. And in those four days, I insisted on using some of the money uh, to pay a stipend for those who attended the programs. I had food. I had food when they came in in the morning, and I had something for lunch. And we had very simple programs where we started out uh, by talking about, do you really want to work? What do you want to do with your life? We found out a lot about folks. 
we found out that surprisingly most of the people in the program in those days had graduated from high school in that area. Uh, we also found out that most of them were involved in drugs in some way. It was, uh, I started right at the height of the crack cocaine explosion in South Central Los Angeles where everybody was trying to make a buck uh, with small amounts of uh, crack cocaine, etc. I discovered that the first day that I had this program, we had standing room only. It dispelled the notion that these poor people, these gang members did not want jobs. They did not want to work. Uh, we also did all of the regular stuff of four days of learning how to fill out a job application, role playing. But the most important thing was the talking and getting to know people and people getting to trust you and beginning to share with you. Uh, people would come up to me afterwards, sign up and say, Ms. Wanis, I want to, but I can't read. I mean, that's not something that they were able to really talk about. Some had dropped out of school, had been just pushed on through, despite the fact they couldn't read, and of all intents and purposes, their lives were kind of over. Others were the children of crack-addicted mothers, and there was no safety net. Others who had fathers and mothers who were in prison. Um, others who uh, simply had no connections and they were living in vacant buildings at times with gangs. So out of all of that, what we did was we said to the City of Los Angeles and the Private Industry Council, you've got to get your people here. We've got to have the job developers. They've got to get not only into real training programs once they come out of what I'm doing, uh, but we've got to have job developers who really develop jobs. And everybody who came into the public housing projects after that, whether it was the housing authority itself attempting to do rehabilitation or the telephone companies laying cable, we made them employ the people who lived in those public housing projects, or they couldn't work there. They just couldn't do it. We were sick and tired of people coming in, earning the money, taking it and going on, you know, across town somewhere and into another county while people standing there unemployed had nothing to do. Jobs will do a hell of a lot to reduce crime and violence. Out of those years, we have homeowners. We have people that got connected because we created the Maxine Waters uh, employment Preparation Center under the Unified School District to make sure there were alternatives. And so I just came here to say this, and I, I know you want me to wrap up, Mr. Chairman. I have a real appreciation for academicians and what you, the research that you may have done, and what you understand about gangs. But I want you to know until you have been on the ground with Crips and Bloods, A-Trays, rolling 40s, 50s, and 60s, and gotten to know these kids and these young people, and the anger and the disappointment and the lack of trust that they have basically in our society and in adults who have let them down time and time again, the only power they have is the power of the gun and the power to threaten and the power to control some territory that you may not think is worth anything, but to them, that's their power uh, to say that you can't come here, you can't do this. This is a complicated problem that requires money. It requires sustained training and development. There should be no poor communities and housing projects that do not have social services, do not have job training programs. There should be no programs that do not have stipends. Don't ask poor people and gang members to sit in training programs every day hungry. I made sure they had money for food, uh, to get clothes clean, uh, to get grandmama to watch the baby, whatever, so that they could listen and uh, try and be a part of it. I have found most people, whether they're gang members or just dropouts or poor people, really aspire to everything else 
all Americans aspire to. Everything that we see on that television. They want homes. They want cars. They want to be able to go to concerts. They want that. So I don't talk to people about just being good, just saying no. I try to empower people with real assets, with real stuff to be able uh, to live with. If you do that and people see that they can get some money and they can uh, pay the rent, they can buy some houses, we can go a long way toward breaking up gangs, breaking up concentrations of gangs and communities. I just had to have my say, and I thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman, and I'll spend a little time before I go back to financial services, because I want to rebuttal. Well, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Ms. Waters, and we'll ask the um, uh, witnesses to respond as part of your other responses. I think uh, you went a little over. The gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, gentlemen, and I want to thank him for holding this hearing. I think it's a very important and, and timely hearing. Um, before I get into my questions, I wanted to mention our colleague, Mr. Coble, who was here earlier, had to leave because uh, he went to Georgia for the funeral services of one of our colleagues, Charlie Norwood, who passed away, and that may be why there aren't more members uh, here uh, today. Um, he also wanted to uh, let, uh, let you know, Mr. Kennedy, that uh, his uh, assistant chief of police back in High Point, North Carolina, sent his uh, thank you for the work that you've been doing in their community. Uh, and I also want to thank you uh, for agreeing to work with the city of Cincinnati uh, in, in its efforts to decrease uh, youth uh, violence. And uh, I was honored to serve on Cincinnati City Council for five years. This is quite a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and live in the city and, and have a lot of, as a citizen, have a lot of concerns about the level of violence uh, in our community. Uh, last year, we, for example, suffered the highest homicide uh, rate that we've had in our city's history, uh, which is obviously most unfortunate, and many of those uh, were related to gangs and to uh, violence relative to drug transactions, and uh, most of them were in the city. So uh, we appreciate uh, your input and hope that you're successful. And I, we had a chance to talk shortly before this hearing, and I was encouraged to hear uh, how certain you were that you're you will be successful here, assuming that, that you get the cooperation of the, of the community and their involvement. Um, and uh, I, I would start out by mentioning you, uh, you had a, uh, an article that appeared by the National Institute of Justice titled Pulling Levers, and, and you advocated uh, the strategy. Uh, could you describe what that strategy is, what it encompasses, and how that would uh, apply uh, in Cincinnati? Thanks, Larry. Sure. I had to make it really complicated to get in into NIJ. It's actually pretty simple. Um, and to, to not rebut but endorse what Congresswoman Waters said, you're exactly right. And this is what Tenney's been saying. It's what mai has been saying. It's what the chief and the DA, we're all saying the same thing here. You know, I, I learned what I know about this from, from Tenney, from gang officers, from community people. Um, the literature helps, but that's that's where I've gotten everything most important in my career. And the, the version that NIJ wouldn't publish is is the version that my, my mother goes to cocktail parties and says that I learned all this from her. And and she's fundamentally correct. You know, we bureaucratize this, we we abstract it, we put it in fancy language, but any any good parent sticks with their kid, establishes rules, helps them learn, punishes them appropriately when they need punishment, but doesn't go away at that point. You don't turn them over to somebody else. You know, if we did if we did families the way we do crime, we'd have one parent responsible for love and support, one for rules and discipline. You'd have to find a third parent for spiritual guidance and the parents would be forbidden by statute from speaking to each other. Now, it's, this is ridiculous. So all, all pulling levers is, and I don't even like that term anymore, um, but all, all it is is a way of engaging consistently with the gr mostly groups of the kind of really extreme offenders that, that Larry's been describing. He's absolutely right about what's going on out there. And saying to them, consistently over time, there are things we won't put up with, 
here is exactly what's going to happen if you do these things. People you respect want you to stop this and want to help you if you'll let them help you. And the piece that we don't think about very much, to say in a moral voice, this is wrong and you know it's wrong. And it turns out that even the most hardened offenders, or, or most of them, really care a lot when their grandmother looks at them and says, you're really disappointing me. I mean, I'm a deterrence theorist, and deterrence theory tells me that if I'm more afraid of my grandmother than I am of the police, let's organize the grandmothers. <laughs> and that's, that's in fact what's going on out there. It's, it's really very simple. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, secondly, Mr. Uh, Let's see, Mr. Sherman and Mr. Logley, if I could ask you the question. For, the, for those that have shown by their behavior to be particularly violent uh, and, and some that are predators on the community, could you talk about the, the important aspects of law enforcement uh, in dealing with those individuals and what we ought to do uh, as a society and, and as a government? I would start with uh, making sure that they are not in possession of uh, or carrying guns. Um, that net nexus is very clear. Um, there is uh, a lot of controversy about how to deal with that problem at large in the community. I believe once people have been convicted and put under conditions of community supervision, the opportunity exists for a judge to reinforce the existing law that says as convicted felons, they. Uh, uh, or, or even as adjudicated delinquents, that uh, they would not uh, have any right to legal possession of guns. Uh, the problem is doing that in a way that's respectful, that doesn't provoke the resentment and further anger that uh, Congresswoman Waters has uh, quite rightly uh, drawn our attention to. And one of the things we're working on right now in the probation police partnership uh, in Philadelphia um, is uh, trying to make the home visit both scheduled and unscheduled. Um, as uh, dignified and supportive an experience for the uh, offender on, on community supervision as possible. So that even though there's two plainclothes officers in an unmarked car who drive the probation officer to the house, what the probation officer does primarily while um, looking around the house uh, uh, in, in addition to other things is to talk with the family, to talk with grandmother, or to talk with whoever's there. Um, about the hopes and aspirations, uh, the, the educational plans, the occupational goals that the uh, probationer has, so that the, the attempt to monitor and regulate the critical issue of gun possession is tied to an expression of concern for and respect for the young offender and his home and the people in the home. Um, and by young, again, I mean under age 25, uh, so that we, we don't um, make the anger uh, at police from a disrespecting kind of contact in, in order to pervert, uh, preserve their non-gun uh, carrying um, a part of a, a larger set of causes of, of what makes them violent. I think we can do that, uh, and I think that if, if we um, are able to uh, pursue uh, not only the, the gun issue, but also issues of compliance with, with programs that uh, because Philadelphia probation officers have had 180 cases per officer, so if an offender doesn't show up for drug treatment or doesn't go to uh, alcohol treatment or uh, even therapy programs or educational programs as required or as, ag as agreed to, nothing happens. There's no consequence. So to lower that caseload, especially with these high-risk people, uh, and, and the astonishing fact that in Philadelphia we have uh, only one-fourth as many probation officers per murder as in the rest of Pennsylvania. Uh, we would need four times as many probation officers just to come up to that ratio in, in the rest of the state, which is why, you know, in the short run, something like a federal grants program to support this sort of uh, high-risk community supervision would be extremely helpful and have, I think, an immediate possibility of reducing the homicide rate in the nation. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, if I understand the question, uh, Congressman, it's 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 uh, what do we do with those people that uh, have already started to offend? And of course, as, as a local district attorney, our many times our first contact with somebody is they show up on our arrest sheet. District attorneys have been described as holding a quasi-judicial office, and I take that terminology seriously. Every morning in my office, we go through a veritable triage 
of screening uh, cases and making charging decisions. And somehow, we have to make wise choices. We've got to, at some point, look at an individual and say, this person is still worth working with. This person can still, with the proper support, turn his or her life around. Then we get to the other extreme. This person, by virtue of what we've seen and their actions in the community, this person is beyond that point. And our job now is to simply prosecute that person effectively and put that person away as long as we can. There are hundreds of gradations in between those two extremes. What helps us make those decisions is if we have available to us programs, many of which have been described this morning, that give us alternatives that, that, that shows us that if this person can be put into that anti-truancy program, if we can work with that family to get that person to go to school and to learn how to read and write, uh, and how to develop job skills so that they can get a job. The most important thing for many of these people is to have a job so they can support a family and make their mortgage payments. But, but if we don't have programs to bring them there, uh, then my job is tougher. Uh, I don't need any more laws. I've got all the criminal laws I need in the state of Illinois. I, I don't need any more sanctions. I, that, the sentences are plenty tough. I've got all the discretion I need. What I need is what Denny talked about, and that's programs on the street that have staying power and that have credibility and that will work with people that I can refer people to because what I do have is a hammer. I have the coercion that might just make that person stick to a program. Uh, whether you call it pulling lovers or anything else, uh, uh, we make that the decision whether they're worth working with or it's just time to warehouse them, and that's a real loss to society. Thank you. Gentleman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a difficult hearing because we have eight or nine witnesses, and uh, all of them have uh, excellent qualifications. And all the of them gentleman, Yale. Uh, yes. We expect to have more rounds of questions. I understand that, but it shot. makes it difficult for those of us who are in several committees to come here and at least ask questions of. So I, mean, I, I, I just just a suggestion. It, it's just they all have excellent uh, ideas and perspectives, and it would be good if we would have a chance to concentrate on several of them rather than all of them. Uh, I'm not into rebuttals, but but I am a little concerned that the only reference made to the Los Angeles Police Department was a negative one about officers exacerbating the situations. Maybe I take it personally because my brother used to be an LA police officer and. He, I recall him responding to a call uh, for drug dealers in Nickerson Gardens, and I recall that uh, it was a drug dealer who had uh, vowed to kill a cop, and I recall that he had my brother directly in his sights, and my brother would have been a victim had not another officer come upon the scene and caused the person to uh, leave. I think we have to understand that while there are bad cops and bad situations, my judgment is most of them want to help the people in the communities that they serve. Um, when I was Attorney General of California, I changed the name of the uh, program we had from the Crime Prevention Center to the Violence and Crime Prevention Center because oftentimes if you wait till it's a crime, it's too late. And I really wanted it pre-violence pre as well because we needed to have um, programs of education before you got the intervention and then intervention and deterrence and punishment. I mean, it's a continuum, it seems to me. I hope that no one disagrees with that. One of the toughest things I had when I put together a juvenile violence task force is to get everybody to talk together. I had a group that was about four times this size representing all the disciplines, and the first time they came in the room, it was kind of interesting. It was kind of like dogs circling one another and not sure what they ought to do because everyone thought if that person gets money, we're not going to get money. And yet, at the end of about a year process, they found common ground, as I think we have here. Um, I'll never forget going to a uh, program in one of the high schools in Los Angeles 
had been the site of a shooting and talking about the safe schools program that we had developed and urged on to other schools. And after it was all over, a young uh, girl, about 14 or 15, came up to me. She happened to be African-American. She said, um, why did it take the death of one of my classmates for you adults to take this seriously? And her emphasis was, why don't you do that which is necessary to provide a safe school environment for me? And so that's why I, I, I take the comments of the representative of the prosecutors here very seriously. We all, I think, want to do things that are in that continuum, but that doesn't mean we don't understand that you have to have a sense of order backed up by a sense of enforcement, backed up by a prospect of punishment if all else doesn't work. Um, I rarely found a victim in a crime uh, say to the responding officer or paramedic, what was the socioeconomic background of the person who just beat me up? It's basically, please take care of my wounds. Please catch that person and make sure he or she doesn't do it to somebody else. So I guess my, my question to the... Um, uh, to the representative of the district attorneys is this. There's been at least some reference of a critical nature to trying juveniles as adults. Um, I view that as an unfortunate but necessary part of the overall system. And um, I, I wonder if you could give us the thoughts uh, from your perspective on how you make that decision uh, what it gives you in the way of alternatives and whether or not you believe it is effective in certain circumstances. Uh, I, I do believe it is one of the more difficult decisions I have to make. And uh, although I have 47 assistant state's attorneys, any decision to transfer a young person into the adult system is made only with my knowledge and assent. That's how serious I believe it is. Some of that discretion has been taken away from us with recent legislative changes in, in my state and many other states, and that is if you charge somebody who happens to be 14 or 15 years old with murder, that's an automatic transfer. If you charge somebody with a sexual assault, uh, a violent sexual assault at a certain age, that's an automatic transfer. There may be no discretion there. There are still some discretionary transfers. Now, I can still short-circuit that state law because I can charge something less than murder. I can charge a lower level sexual assault, perhaps. But sometimes, you know, I, I'm not in the business of writing fiction. You've got to charge what the conduct really is. Um, but in those cases where we have the discretion, yes, it's based on prior record, it's based on threat to the community. Many times it's based on the fact that there are no programs in the juvenile system that is really going to have a credible impact on that young person. And we really have no choice when we're looking at preventing future victimization. And if we don't have anything in the community that can really address that young person's problems, and, 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 and specifically I'm talking about sometimes the 15, 16-year-old sexual assault offender. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know we're here talking about gangs, but, I mean, that's one of the situations where there are very few alternatives uh, to just trying to protect the community. When it comes to gang involvement, I think we have a few more uh, alternatives uh, but again, uh, I mean, you've got a, you've got a, I don't go out of my way to transfer aggravated batteries or, or uh, the lower level felonies into adult court. I think that we can deal with that in juvenile court. Um, when it comes to gang affiliation uh, there uh, and gang related criminal activity, they're having effective programs that can deal with that would certainly prevent some of that transferring. But in certain cases where there's murder, uh, there's a serious sexual assault that may be somehow uh, gang-related. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's probably, in, in many of those cases, a tough decision, but we have to move them up. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to have another round of um, questions. And do you want to go now? I'll uh, defer to the gentlelady from California. Uh, thank you very much, and I just want to take uh, the first minute to say to my colleague from 
California, that we are all sensible adults uh, elected by the people because we have de demonstrated some qualities that uh, people support. Nobody suggests uh, that all cops, all police are bad police. I had qualified my remarks somewhat about ill-trained, uh, insensitive, uh, and there are those two. So we understand that they're good cops and they're bad cops. And I have to put that on the record because oftentimes uh, these statements are made uh, in ways that would have uh, listeners believe that somehow there are only a few people who care about the good cops and others who do not. Uh, I do know over my years of experience, and if you read the papers and you know anything about Los Angeles, we have a history of the tensions between the police uh, and the community. And that's not fictional, that's real, um, whatever the reasons are for that. Um, I understand there was some discussion about the truce work. I know that we have, uh, we have programs in Los Angeles and we have some people who have been involved for quite some time in doing truce work and a lot of our young uh, ex-gang members, the OGs, uh, are advocates for funding for truce work. I'm not so sure that there's any permanency to it, that uh, sometimes you can put out a potential confrontation, uh, but um, there appears to linger uh, the um, possibilities of confrontation because uh, when there are, are you know, various gangs in, in these communities, you have friends, relatives who have been killed, uh, and uh, the uh, revenge motive does not, does not go away easily. Who can tell me about your successful truce work that is sustainable that has made a difference? I think that you're very right. When uh, when there is a, a homicide, it's a lot harder to come back than a simple shooting, right? And anger is uh, resides for a long time. Uh, I think first you before you bring sides together, you just try and get a ceasefire, right? Can we just calm down? Can we work? We support the victim's family. Mothers are a great asset, right? A moral voice. I'll never forget in 2001, I was stunned. I run a nonviolence institute, a mother who lost her son, about 20 minutes later on TV says, absolutely no revenge in my name. We're still working together, right? Obviously, moral voice has a lot of clout. Her side has not retaliated. It is now 2007. We take very seriously funerals. We go to funerals. We just had a funeral of young bloods. Everyone was in red. We support them. We help them get some funds. Um, we help with the family. We get them a refund from the funeral home. We coddle them. Yes, we do. So there is a sympathy and help. We help one of the one of the OG says on the side to one of our Cambodian street workers, "Can you get me some mental health?" He wouldn't say it in front of his crew. So there is a search there, and there is an understanding and you reason that do we need another life loss? We use the parents. Look what they're going through. Does the other side who is also Cambodian need to go through that? Okay. Another thing yeah. real quick, if I can yes. just say, following Monday, we went to see one of the main shooters of this gang, twice convicted of guns uh, charges, in jail. Had a conversation then. He wanted, he reached out to that. He's seeing now differently. So you pull any lever you have. We don't mind walking on the carpet on our knees as long as we can create the conditions to calm this thing down. Does anyone else have a model for a truce work that's sustainable, that works, that uh, has caused um, the cessation of, uh, of warfare for over any um, sustained period of time? Yes, Mr. Kennedy. There are examples of truces like that. So here in the district, the Alliance of Concerned Men has, has truces that I think are over 10 years old now, and they, they work as, as Tenny works. There is no model for that. There are examples, but there are no examples of ways to consistently do that when one or both parties aren't willing, and I think that's the state of the art. May I ask also, um, 
if any of you with the connections or the work that you do calls uh, a meeting of shot callers from gangs, would the police allow you all to meet? Uh, let me hear from uh, May Fernandez. My Fernandez. Yeah, we've worked in very close collaboration with the police department here in Washington D.C. And now that we're in Maryland, we've also worked very closely with them. They know the gang members. They 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 know that they come to our youth center. They talk with them regularly. They talk to their parents regularly. So so you don't have gang injunctions where uh, either. One of several situations exist. A condition of parole is they cannot be in the company of other gang members or injunctions such as the one in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, they can't be in certain places. They can't languish. They can't linger. They can't associate. And a meeting would be considered a violation of that. You don't have that situation. There may be individual cases where that exists, but that's not something that's been that we have used or I've known in my experience. I also think that even if that injunction existed and that meeting was called by both community and law enforcement officials, that it probably wouldn't be a violation. Not law enforcement. Community leaders, program operators who really want to talk uh, without intimidation, without fear, without the thought that the police is listening. Again, if you call that kind of meeting, would you have any kind of interference, surveillance, or intimidation? No. I mean, I think because we've worked so closely with the police department and the public officials in D.C., we wouldn't. Okay. There's a trust that's developed between us and them. That didn't always exist. Okay. It's existed probably, we've developed it over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Butts, you've been the lost man for a few minutes there, so I want to come back to you with uh, just some of your testimony that you uh, mentioned earlier. And, and I think I heard you right, but did you say 1994 was the last year we really had like a spike in violence, or did I misinterpret that? If you plotted out the, the incidence rate of serious violent crime, you would see it climbing throughout the late 80s, peaking about 94, 95, and then falling dramatically. So if, if I had a graph and I could draw it, I would draw it up like this from the 80s to 94 and then from 94 to today, it's... So about 2004. It's been, been on a decline. Right, and then it starts to pick up again. Good. So the periods of time um, in which um, the chairman was referencing all of the bills of the Judiciary Committee and, and all has worked on, during that period of time there's been a um, decline by that graph in uh, violent crime in the United States. Um, the other question I'd have, Mr. Sherman, um, just wanted to make sure um, I heard you correctly or read your testament correctly. You said as many as 76% of all murders in Philadelphia involve convicted or charged offenders under supervision of community supervision agencies. Uh, as either victims or suspects recognizing the fact that over half of the murders go unsolved, so we, we can uh, measure 100% of the victims. Uh, but uh, we're, we're taking educated guests based on the arrests, uh, the arrests that have been made as to how many of those in which no arrest is made uh, were also committed by people who were either uh, uh, under supervision of the court because they were awaiting trial, but in the community, and that's 30,000 people in Philadelphia. Uh, on probation or parole at the county level, that's 52,000. On state parole, that's 9,000. Or in juvenile probation, which is 6,000, it adds up to one out of every 15 people in Philadelphia is in the community at large under court supervision, but only a tiny fraction of them are highly likely to kill somebody. And what we're doing is trying to reinvent probation and parole, at least at the adult level, to focus on the very dangerous people and to use New York's model of using a simple computer with palm print identification to have the monthly visit with all the low risk programs. To predict, to predict that. And um, Mr. Kennedy, uh, you know, one of the statements that you made uh, was about organizing the grandmothers um, to do that. But one of the things that was shocking to me, I was speaking in Arkansas at a gang summit that they had out there, and Louise Cardona, who Mr. Sherman's probably familiar with from Maryland, and my, you might be familiar with Ms. Fernandez, who, um, you know, is, is one of their key people, was a former gang member, works for the state of Maryland now in gang prevention. But he told me something that just shocked me. He said the number one group 
that works against his efforts in Maryland. He said, you'll be shocked at who this group is. And I said, who? He said, it's the mothers. He said, the mothers scream at me and curse at me because they want their kids involved in uh, these gangs because of the economic benefits they're getting from. And Mr. Lugley, I, I'm looking here at your testimony that you had earlier about this story of the mother in New Orleans. That was in your written testimony, yes. who, as I understand it, uh, actually took the gun and put it in her son's hand and told him to go out and kill the person he was in a fight with and had a picture of it on, on her wall. Is that? Well, she had a picture from a previous time of the young man holding a weapon. Uh, and uh, when that young man was uh, uh, beaten up uh, by a rival and came home, she said, well, go out there and, and make your revenge. And, and he went out and within, uh, I think it was 20 or 30 minutes, had killed the other young man. So the question kind of real for a moment. Uh, pardon me? You real, is that an aberration or is something? That well, I, I don't know. Mr. Cardona from Maryland uh, is the one who told me he is their provincial. Exactly. We can bring him in to testify. Can I respond to that? Sure. Um, I, I want to be careful here because I, I, I don't know him and I don't, I don't know what he's saying. And I've never met him before. But. Um, in, in 25 years of doing this, I have never, ever seen any organized group in, in a community, mothers or anybody else, oppose efforts to get their kids out of trouble or oppose efforts and I think that's what we or, would normally or, or to organize we would normally assume that but, that is unheard of. But we're hearing testimony of that. There was a case on TV not too long ago where a lady actually drove her son to uh, a home to send him in to um, rob someone at gunpoint. Was a member of a gang. Came he was shot. Came back out and they had to call 911 to pick him up and she was arrested. But whatever the case. That, that makes it very difficult sometime on prevention programs if, if we do have that. Mr. Logley, I wanted to ask you a question also. You tell us that, um, you know, there has been this huge shift in gangs uh, that we've seen in more of the international uh, gangs that are coming into the country now. As I mentioned our testimony earlier, we have high percentages of gang members who are here illegally now. And also the whole meth trade has shifted in just the last few years. It used to be kind of a homegrown uh, variety. Now we have these Walmart, if you would, kinds of uh, meth um, cartels that are being put in Mexico with the gang networks coming in to the United States. Your written testimony talked about those and the increasing use of 16 and 17 year olds to do their activity because, quote, the belief that juveniles will not get any uh, time. And my question uh, to you is this. We have heard testimony in here that if we simply arrest the 16 or 17 year old, 20 more will pop up in their place because these gangs will continue to recruit and put them in there. With the laws that you currently have uh, as a state prosecutor, how are you going after those national gangs that may be located in other states with their headquarters and other places out there? Well, I, I really, uh, as a local prosecutor, um, not in too much of a shape to go after uh, the organization as an organization. We deal with the individuals. Uh, we have unique challenges uh, with those gangs. Uh, uh, in my community, I have bilingual police officers and bilingual prosecutors. We're probably not enough. And so there's a communication problem. Uh, there is also a, a, a uh, uh, not that we get tremendous cooperation from all gang members, uh, but we get we get less cooperation uh, from the, the, uh, the Latino or Hispanic community, especially recent uh, arrivals, uh, simply because they came out of countries where the police were very corrupt and the government was very corrupt, and they carry that distrust with them into our, into our nation. Um, and, and so we have a, a real problem getting cooperation in, in terms of witnesses. Uh, we find that a lot of those gangs, because of that, will simply seek out their own revenge. And I understand that, um, and don't disagree with you at all on that, but what I'm trying to get at specifically is how do you, as a local prosecutor, 
go after the gang networks on these national and international gangs? Uh, that's, uh, as we used to say in the service, that's above my pay grade. So uh, you really can't. We really can't. And we, there's where we rely probably on cooperation of the U.S. Attorney's Office. They've got the resources. They've, they've got the network of uh, officers in other states, prosecutors in other states. They, they can really go after more of the organization. We, we really are and, to direct at the individual. And would you agree with me that it's important to go after the networks? and try to pull the networks down. If we can, certainly. I mean, that's uh, if you can go to the head of the organization, decapitate the head, you'll, you'll reduce the effectiveness. But I've got to tell you, uh, Congressman, I, I do not believe that the Latino gangs that we're seeing are, are terribly organized. I don't believe they're highly organized. I think there's a lot of loose associations. Uh, they're, they're not as organized as the, the, the Bloods, the Crips, the Gangster Disciples, the Vice Lords. They're, you, you got almost a business organization. We, we haven't quite seen that yet with the uh, uh, the Hispanic or Latino gang. And last two questions, and I know my time has expired uh, too, but um, uh, Mr. Kennedy, again, I'm, I'd love to sit down sometime and talk with all of you at length because you've all got some great ideas, but one of the things that you did uh, emphasize in terms of the balance of, of your testimony, I think, before is uh, you had stated one time before that the use of federal sanctions was very important in ceasefire and knocking the homicide rate way down. Um, and you specifically talked about the effectiveness of the federal prosecutions if, if they were used properly in their judicious use. Um, and then, uh, Ms. Fernandez, when you talked about the homicides in Washington, D.C., I believe it was five, eight, eight, eight but, but those homicides uh, were prosecuted and the people uh, incarcerated, wasn't that correct? Yes. And after that, there were no additional um, homicides that you could report today of, of that uh, Correct. Perfect. We put the program in place while the homicides were taking place, and I think that it was both, again, the character combination of the two. The right. 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 Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Chief Corwin, uh, your written testimony mentions the nurse family partnership. Can you describe um, the effect of that program? Nurse Family Partnership. Mm -hmm. I'm not real familiar with that particular program. It's uh, the the Kids Network is the ones that are really familiar with that. But we can provide additional information for you if you'd like. Uh, your testimony and your written testimony indicates that it um, has shown a reduction in crime, uh, significant reduction in crime for those that um, have had that uh, resource. Can you tell us the multidimensional um, foster care program? I can give you the, the other information. I can provide that research to you. Okay. And bully, preven and bully prevention? I believe there's also actually people here on the panel can probably speak specifically to those, those particular programs. Okay. Mr. Chairman, those, those are blueprint programs, and I can describe them for you. Nurse Family Partnership is a program that uh, initiates uh, with single at-risk uh, mothers, first pregnancy. Uh, the, it involves a nurse visitation program when she registers for prenatal care and continues with nurse visits to the home until the child is two years old. So it's about a two and a half year intervention. Uh, that intervention has proved very, very effective. It reduces uh, the incidence of child abuse by almost 80%. It reduces uh, the unemployment rates uh, on the part of the mothers to drug involvement on the part of the mothers. And 15 years later, when those kids are adolescents, it reduces the risk for arrest by 60% and conviction by almost 90% for those kids. MST is multi-systemic family therapy. I mentioned that earlier. It's a, it's a program which is a clinical intervention, six months. It's a family-based intervention, uh, which has proved to be very effective. It can reduce the risk of, of recidivism by as much as 75%. Uh, the multi-systemic treatment foster care program is one of the most cost-effective programs we have. It returns about $13 for every dollar we invest in it. It's also for deep end, what we call deep end kids, but it's a foster care program. Um, and it's, it's um, one of the programs which we recommend as uh, going to scale with across the country. All three of those programs are programs we could put in across the country. And the importance of bullying prevention? The bullying prevention program, it's a blueprint program, it's the one developed by Dan Olveas in Norway, and that program reduces the incidence of bullying on our elementary and middle school campuses by 50% and has a dramatic effect upon the social climate of the school and reduces uh, and actually increases school performance as well. And Mr. Kennedy, your, your program has shown success, <coughs> excuse me, in um, getting truces, has, have you had seen any successes in reducing gang membership to begin with? Well, the, what we produce 
aren't truces because we don't ask. Truces are voluntary. This is not voluntary. Offering help and bringing in the community is not the same as saying, if you don't go along with this, we're going to let you do that. There's, there's an or else here that's very important. But yes, the fact is, and, and I, I am now convinced that the absolute most important preventive action we can take is to dethrone the very hardcore that is controlling the streets, modeling behavior for younger kids, and making the community and all the rest of us look like idiots. And if they lose their standing on the street, then that no longer becomes an attractive track for younger kids. And the danger and the fear that drives them into banding together for self-protection is, is greatly eased. And if, if I can refer back to Mr. Forbes' question, we're seeing this basic framework work equally effectively with MS-13, with the Daniel Sereno, West Coast gangs. We don't, we don't see, and nobody that I know that's, that's engaged with MS-13 at the local level sees the kind of organized, purposeful structure that we're being told MS-13 has. And I think the stories that are being told about MS-13, particularly by the FBI, are profoundly misleading. And I don't know any gang researchers or any people in local law enforcement that agree with those pictures. Um, and Ms. Mr. Loach, um you mentioned witness intimidation as a problem. Uh, what can we do to address that problem? The biggest problem we have at the state level is resources. <clears throat> and um, uh, and what, what would you do with additional resources? Uh, we could, uh, uh, we don't have to move people great distances. We can move them from one side of town to another side of town. Uh, we can move them temporarily into a motel. We can give them a cell phone so they can call the police if there's problems. We don't need the new identities and move them off into some community in Arizona. Uh, uh, but our resources are really tight on that. And if the if the uh, if the uh, uh, federal government could could uh, uh, provide some money to get these programs going, and then through matching grants that type of thing encourage states to start their own funding stream that would be a, a huge step in 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 the uh, in a very constructive uh, direction and finally ms fernandez does your gip program reduce gang membership um yes it does i mean it's, and how does it do that well if you come down and talk to any of our kids a lot of times you find out that the reason that they're in a gang is because they're bored they didn't have anything to do after school we get them involved in other stuff. We have art programs. We have dance programs. We have leadership programs. Um, you name it, we've got an alternative for it. And um, it's that what the kids are looking for. You know, in the cases that they've dropped out of school, they need jobs. And so we help them get into those. So it's really creating alternatives that's the, the key. Thank you. If there are no other questions. So, well, Chairman, I have follow-up question. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, you talked about the fact that um, these gangs aren't organized. Um, you're aware that the Attorney General and Salvadorian President have just entered uh, arrangements and agreements between the two countries because they felt that they were highly organized and coming back and forth. So you think that they were both wrong in, in that recognition? What, what we see where MS-13 and, and other Hispanic gangs, which is mostly what we're talking about with, with ties, generally th it's three-way ties. It's, it's local in the U.S., there's a California connection, and then there's a, a Latin American connection. What we see going on at the local level is very high levels of, of crime, including some extremely serious violence. Right? So this is not to say it's not important. It is important. It's very real and it's very dangerous. But what we see driving that is the same kind of local nonsense that we see with other gang structures. The shots are not being called either from California or from San Salvador. So that's all I can speak to is, is and, what and the local Boston, presentation is. Boston, where you had such good success and all in, in your process there, um, now that they've had this uptick, I think, back in, have they asked you to come back? Um, there and reinstitute your program there. We've been discussing that. Okay. Yes, they don't. They don't need me, right? There, there are people in Boston who know this inside out, and the the commitment, the public. It, it, look, this is a nasty story, but Boston has now said in plain language, we kicked this thing to the curb. We 
we made a mistake and we need to put it back together. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, well, first I'd like to ask you, are there any former gang members in the audience that I could hear from with just their thoughts or their advice about what they think we could be doing? <clears throat> Good. Uh, could, I don't know. It's up to the chairman. To, may I hear from one? Uh -huh. Yeah. And while they're, you, while they're coming... Did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, that's my question. If I could hear from a gang member, their thoughts about what they've heard, any advice that they may have. And before he starts to say to Mr. Kennedy, he missed one connection uh, with the so-called Mexican gangs, and that's the prison where the shot callers are. All right. If, if it's all right, Mr. Chairman. An objection to oh, them. Mr. Chairman, the only thing, I'd, I'd love to hear from them if we could schedule a time, but we've we got several members left. They don't get to ask any questions and all at this particular point in time, so why don't we schedule I would ask unanimous consent uh, of my colleagues to allow that to happen. Is there objection? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just say this. I, I would think we ought to have an opportunity to have every member be here just to hear what they say. We want to hear from them and schedule an opportunity that they can come back and test. We'd love to have them. I'd love to hear them and bring in Mr. Cardona and several other people if you'd like to do that. If I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, I too would agree that we should have additional hearings. Uh, there, will be, there, will be there will be additional hearings on this issue and hopefully even field hearings so we can... Um, have additional hearings out in the field where the situations are. I would appreciate that and I would also, if I may, and I don't, I don't like pushing this hard, but one of the things that I've discovered working with young people is they don't think they get their chance at the table and they don't think we listen and they don't think we care. So if I could indulge my colleague, I would like if to hear from If we could hear briefly, we have to be out of the room by um, 1230. Okay. Was there objection? Um, if you could identify yourself um, and make a brief statement. My name is David Cartagena. I'd like to thank you for giving me the privilege and the opportunity to speak to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Mortis. Uh, one of the things that I can say real briefly is growing up um, with gang affiliation, growing up in a housing project, growing up as an inner city minority, although I don't have the appearance, um, what I found is that in my upbringing, there was a lot of negative influences. There wasn't no big brother program for me, although it existed, it wasn't in my neighborhood. There wasn't no uh, lawyers, or clergy, or any positive, basically male role models, positive influences. So what I've done in my occupation as a Providence street worker is to become that for youth and kids that have gang involvement. It's to come somebody, become somebody who's been there, done that, and who also now is aspiring to live positively and to, um, to try to get them to aspire to want to achieve bigger and better things versus living uh, negative, uh, being reactionary rather than proactive. So uh, not only am I a, a nonviolent street worker, I'm also a youth advocate. I do job advocacy. I do court advocacy. I go to court and advocate when I can. I, uh, I'm a mentor. I'm a mediator. I'm a... Um, you know, I'm a licensed mediator, facilitator, um, and I'm also, more importantly, I'm a positive role model, somebody who's been there, who's made the mistakes, who has overcome obstacles, and is now willing to give back to the community and help young kids not make the mistakes I've made. And what I've come to find is that's the thing that strikes the chord with them the most. What they need is people that have lived there, people that are just like them, but that live a whole different frame of mind now, that are trying to steer them away from making it versus in their neighborhoods, they have uh, drug dealers, low-level, mid-level. Mid they have people that are immersed in gang activity, and those are their role models. Those are their peers. Those are the people they look up to. Those are the people they look to for input, for information, for guidance. So I come and I try to intercede, and I try to be, give them better information. I try to give them real street knowledge about, you know, the, uh, the dangers of being involved in that kind of uh, behavior and stuff. Thank you. Can I ask David a question? D David, what gang were you? In? I'm sorry, he said he said it was David. Did I miss him? Yes. I thought you, you said your name was David, wasn't it? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, uh, David, what gang were you in, if you don't mind telling us, sir? Uh, Almighty Latin King Nation. Um, and, and David, how are you dealing with the young people that you have to, to deal with in terms of 
their fear, you know, their desire for protection from other gangs. Is that a very big element out there among them, or how do, how do you help them with that? So, you know, it's one thing if you get the guy on the street that's trying to get them involved in buying or selling drugs for monetary reasons, but we're hearing a lot from gang uh, members who say that they were just afraid if they didn't join one gang that they would be intimidated and threatened by another. Are you experiencing that, and how do you try to protect them from that? Um, one of the ways that I'm able to protect them is that I have no bones or problems with speaking to the opposition, speaking to the other gangs. I'm out at 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. It doesn't matter. Any way I can to try and better the life of a young individual, it's what I'm going to do. So if they feel, if they say, look, you know, I want to come out, but the only thing is I have a problem because, you know, my manito over there or my senior, he ain't really going to be looking too favorably at that. I'll go talk to that individual, and I'll go speak to the gang in, itself, and I'll let them know who I am, what I do. And basically, people, for the most part, not just gang members, they know right from wrong. You know, they know right from wrong. So if they know I'm actually caring and I'm coming with compassion and love for that individual, more than likely, they don't want any static or bad publicity or anything like that that can come upon them. They might, they, most of the time, they leave, the, they leave the kid alone, especially because I work with a lot of kids that are under the age of 17. Did any threats on you individually in, in doing this? or Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sal Montero. I represent the uh, Institute for Studying Practice of Nonviolence. This is just to uh, the question that you asked earlier about if gangs get together in the city, do the police uh, say anything or is it, you know, violation of parole? Uh, we work in Providence, and Providence is very small. It's, you know, it's not real big. And we have gang members on all sides of town. And being as small as Providence is, they're going to meet. They're going to run into each other. You know, whether it's at the mall, whether it's at the store, whether it's at the corner, whether it's at the club. So being as street workers as we are, like uh, Mr. Kennedy said, most of these gangs, there's only two or three guys in there that are really running things and are really saying, you know, running and calling the shots. So instead of waiting for them to meet each other on the street, whether it's a you know, violation of their parole, we're going to go, as street workers, we're going to go get those two or three individuals that's really calling all the shots. And we're going to sit them down, and we're going to talk to them, and we're going to try to mediate the situation and solve the problem because most of the problems come from either he say, she say, you know, information gathering. You know, this person said this about me, that person said this about me. And, you know, before it gets out of control, instead of letting them meet each other out in the streets, out in public where, you know, gunshots and fight and other individuals can get hurt, we bring them down, we're going to sit them down, we're going to talk to them, we're going to mediate the situation, we're going to come to a cause, find out what the problem is, why you're fighting, what's the problem, and we're going to settle it. So whether it's the case of violating parole, you know, I don't think we, we can take that into consideration. The, the fact is that we want the violence to stop. We don't want this gang member. And also another thing that we tell the uh, gang, the young kids, how we get across to them that if me and you know, this gentleman have a problem, he's in one gang, I'm not in a gang, but I have a problem with him, I go join another gang. Now all the pro I had one problem with him, and now I got a problem with every person in his gang. I got a problem with all the people that he has a problem with in his gang. So uh, there's a lot of different ways that when you come from the streets, when you live out there in the hood, there's a lot of certain ways that we come across these kids that they see that they don't see it anywhere else. Um, if there are no uh, further questions, I'd like to thank the witnesses for their testimony today. Mr. Uh, Chairman, might I please? A uh, gentlelady from Texas. I, I'd indicated we need to be out of the room by 1230. I thank the Chairman very much. Uh, this is a issue that I'd like to credit um, Chairman Scott for beginning even before 1995, my first year uh, in uh, the United States Congress and certainly the work of Congresswoman Waters and a number of other uh, members. I remember flying around um, on field hearings asking attorney generals and law enforcement officers in 1995 not to fall victim to the crime bill and believe that incarceration was the only answer. And we have reaped what we have sowed. We literally ceded America uh, to gangs and gang violence, uh, primarily because we left no other alternatives and opportunities for young people. This may be the most historic and real opportunity for us to get real and to be able to confront uh, many of these issues. I would just ask uh, two uh, straightforward questions, David. Um, 
one and then to um, and the distinguished uh, academicians um, who's first. David, is there hope? Can intervention now really work? Uh, can we explain or get the word by way of resources and prevention dollars to the folk on the streets and folk like you who are working uh, to make a real decided change? I'd just like to try and give you a brief example. All right. I have a 16-year-old um, juvenile who's part of an African-American gang on the east side of Providence that I work with on a constant basis. I do follow-up. I constantly outreach to him. He called me about three weeks ago. He was at a basketball game playing a rival team. There was 30 or 40 kids there from another rival faction that he has beef with that all wanted to get him. And because he was on the other side of town, he had no protection. He didn't have any of his companions with him and his, and his colleagues or whatever, compadres. And uh, he called me. And he said, look, David, I'm at this basketball game. I don't know what I'm going to do. These dudes really want to get at me. What am I going to do? I said, I'll be right there. SOS. I shot right over there. I sat in the bleachers with him because his game had already surpassed. I sat in the bleachers with him. At the conclusion of the game, I actually had assistance from some of my colleagues and some of the faculty at the school yeah. to whisk him out of the back of the school and get him out of there. Now, upon the conclusion of the game, Police came to the area, responded because they, they heard of a threat of gang violence potentially happening. They pulled over a car and arrested four juveniles who were his potential enemies and confiscated a firearm in the car. So what I'm saying is, does it work? Of course it does. He could have probably got killed. He could have got stomped to death that night. Yeah. You know? But because he believed in a youth worker, he believed in, a, in a, an adult that could help him and assist him and get him out of that uh, problem, he's been all right. And since then, he hasn't even hung with his... East Side buddies. He hasn't been in any trouble. He's been working. He's been going to school, minding his business. He's still on the basketball team. He just stays clear from certain games. But that's my. And he's alive. And he's alive. He's so that's alive. my assessment. The, uh, that intervention. Work. Can I just, exactly. just quickly for Dr. Uh, Dr. Elliott, just uh, very quickly. Ms. They laughed Ms. at Ms. me. Ms. Excuse me. Um, I think I asked the gentlelady from. Um, Texas to suspend because I indicated we had to be out. Is it 12:30? Uh, all right, I after, can't see after the time. 12:30, and uh, we can have written uh, questions for our witnesses, and we ask them to forward which, which will forward to you, and ask that you answer as promptly as you can to be made part of the record. Um, and without objection, the um, uh, hearing is uh, is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.